You wake up to the sound of shouting and screaming. Your girlfriend is pushing you out of the bed demanding that you leave or at least sleep on the sofa. What's going on? You were fast asleep minding your own business. Is she tripping or something? Hearing her voice go into high pitched mode as she hurls accusations your way, your automatic reaction is to get defensive. Still, you try to stay calm and defend yourself. This has happened before and you know how it ended last time. After a few moments, you take in what she's actually saying. She's claiming you were aggressively thrusting and trying to get fresh with her while she was asleep. Nonsense! You were asleep too. Maybe she was just dreaming. But she seems so convinced that you don't dare suggest it. What's going on? Sexsomnia is a rare disorder that causes some unusual sleeping habits. Whereas insomniacs have trouble sleeping, sexsomniacs engage in sexual acts while asleep. This is different from having a wet dream or an orgasmic experience during your slumber because the person engages in full-on sexual acts like masturbation or intercourse. When they wake up, they have no idea what just happened. Imagine you could lose your virginity and not even realize. Madness. It's also possible to combine this sleep sex with sleep talking and sleep walking, so you could have the full shebang with some freaky outdoor sex outside and dirty talk. Madness. Having sex in your sleep might sound harmless or even pleasurable, but it can lead to some dire consequences. But first, let's look at the science behind this sexy phenomenon. Sexsomnia is a type of parasomnia, a term that encompasses all kinds of abnormal activities that can happen while we're asleep. Sleepwalking and sleep talking are the most common and well known, but it turns out we can get up to all kinds of weird stuff. Sleep related eating disorders make people binge eat while asleep. Confusional arousals aren't the weird stuff you're into that you shouldn't tell others about. They're also known as sleep drunkenness because they make us function at lower brain capacity and talk rubbish. And REM sleep behavior disorders see people fighting imaginary intruders or running away from non-existent monsters. Different types of parasomnia take place at different points in the sleep cycle. When we first nod off, we go into a light sleep for a few minutes. Then we enter the second stage of sleep, which is also pretty light and ideal for brief naps. In the third and fourth stages, we finally enter deep sleep, a restorative state that helps us boost our immune system, energy, and repair our body tissue. Afterward, we go into rapid eye movement or REM sleep for around 90 minutes. At this point, the brain becomes more active and we consolidate our memories. It's also the part of sleep where we dream. Most cases of sexsomnia take place during non-rapid eye movement or NREM during stages 3 and 4. Since these are the deepest stages of the sleep cycle and don't involve dreams, the mind can go a little crazy. The parts of the brain that control vision, movement, and emotion remain awake during NREM sleep, but the parts controlling memory, decision making, and rationality are asleep. Yep, sounds like a recipe for disaster. Most types of parasomnia occur during NREM sleep, including sleepwalking and sleep talking, but there are also a few disorders that can happen during REM sleep. A key example is sleep paralysis, waking up paralyzed while partially emerged in a dream state, which is why it's so terrifying. Because sexsomnia occurs during deep sleep and we don't remember it when we wake up, it's difficult to diagnose yourself. Symptoms include heavy breathing, sweating, masturbating, pelvic thrusting, spontaneous orgasm, fondling, an elevated heart rate, and blank stares. To me, that just sounds like the normal state of a hormone-filled teenager, but there you go. Although we have a vague understanding of sexsomnia now, it's still murky on the details. What causes it? How often does it happen? We're still not sure. Naturally, it's pretty challenging for scientists to investigate sexsomnia. You can't just repeatedly make two people fall asleep together in a laboratory, hoping that eventually they'll have sex while sleeping. Then repeat it with a hundred other couples because you need a bigger sample size to reach any conclusion. We'll probably be in the dark about this one for a long time. However, there are some theories. Some researchers think the causes of sexsomnia could be exhaustion, alcohol, drugs, anxiety, or poor sleeping conditions, and sharing a bed with someone, although it's hard to ignore that one altogether. So, we can only assume that attempting to cope with extreme stress by taking drugs, partying until the early hours, and getting into bed with your friend who has an uncomfortable mattress is a terrible idea and not a healthy coping mechanism. You learn something new every day. Even though it's notoriously difficult to research sexsomnia, a few cases have been found, and I'll tell you now, it doesn't end well. The first case of sexsomnia was reported as recently as 1986. That could be because humans are getting progressively hornier over time, but most likely it's just because nobody thought it was worthwhile to report before then. I mean, what person in their right mind would ring up their doctor after they masturbated in their sleep? You'd just shrug it off and go about your day, wouldn't you? Even now, only 194 cases have ever been reported, 
and there's very little information available about most of them. But in 2017, one man in the UK was successfully diagnosed after ending up in hot water with both his current and his ex-girlfriend. We don't know his actual name, so let's call him Bob. First, Bob crashed at his ex-girlfriend's house one night. It's not a good idea at the best of times, but in fairness to him, they had a kid together. What could go wrong, right? Turns out, a lot can go wrong. Bob woke up to find his ex screaming at him, accusing him of rape. He was confused and alarmed, believing he'd done nothing of the sorts, but decided it was best to leave promptly and let her calm down. It was probably a bad call to not talk it out and investigate further, because the incident ended with him being accused of rape and convicted as guilty by the jury. Still, Bob didn't understand what had happened and believed he was innocent. Then a similar pattern happened with his next girlfriend. The first night they slept in the same bed, she was annoyed to find him fondling her and thrusting in the middle of the night, but brushed it off and said nothing. Then another night, after a boozy party she was woken up in the middle of the night, she shouted at Bob angrily, angry that he'd wake her up and have such little respect for her boundaries. It was so out of character too, he was usually so gentle and thoughtful. Much to her surprise, Bob seemed taken aback, confused, and denied anything had happened. Was he an evil gaslighting genius, or was there something even stranger going on here? Bob saw a doctor who pointed out the rare disease of sexsomnia. Suddenly everything made sense. He wasn't a forgetful sexual predator, he'd literally been sleeping throughout all the incidents. To verify it really was sexomnia, the doctor referred him to a sleep clinic in London where he could be monitored. The researchers put electrodes to his scalp as he slept to monitor his brain activity and found some surprising results. During the incidents, Bob was effectively both awake and asleep at the same time. The sleep cycle of regular people was out the window. There were both the slow brain waves associated with deep sleep and the fast rhythms and brain waves associated with being awake. They diagnosed him with sexomnia. Another man from Scotland was cleared of rape charges after doctors diagnosed him with sexomnia, but it's still a legal gray area for now. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. Are you the kind of person that wakes up and always seems to feel tired? Sometimes you got 8 hours of sleep, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 5 hours, but never mind how well you think you slept, you always wake up feeling slightly groggy. Don't worry, you're not alone. Let's now attempt to put things right for you. While waking up for you is nothing special, a lot of things happen to your body when you awaken in the morning. For instance, your heart rate will get faster and your breathing will become quicker. Your blood flow will increase and your brain will start producing different kinds of brain waves. Your liver and kidneys during the night were in sleep mode, but when you awake, they go back to waking mode. You basically rev up for the day and when you open those eyes of yours, the lot of external stimuli will flood your blood. During the night, when you were in sleep mode, you'll have experienced something called RAM or rapid eye movement. Most people have about five of these periods during sleep, interspaced with non-REM sleep. If you want to know what REM looks like, just watch your dog's eyes flickering when it's enjoying some Z's. It's during these rapid eye movements when you dream and you're in what we call deep sleep. If you've ever woken up in the middle of a dream, you've woken up during REM. This is important for today's show because the experts say we need this deep sleep. Sometimes you might take a pill to sleep, and while you may think you've gotten a good night's sleep, the drugs may have affected how much real deep sleep you got. Let's say you didn't get down with enough REM. You'll likely know this because when you wake up, you'll feel tired and mightily irritable throughout the day. If this keeps happening, you'll get more irritable, and not getting enough sleep over a long period of time can actually affect affect your health, because when we sleep, our bodies go into repair mode. When we're sleeping, we're charging, and if you want to wake up feeling supercharged, then you have to get enough sleep. Dreaming is important too, it's like allowing your thoughts to spill out. It's kind of a psychological cleansing. So we're told that the average adult should be getting 7-9 to nine hours of good sleep per night. Many of you will now be thinking, hmm, that's not me. Some of you will get that much sleep but still wake up tired. Now we're going to tell you how you can wake up feeling better. First of all, watch what you eat. You shouldn't eat a lot before you sleep, and if you've snacked on a bunch of processed carbs before bedtime, your blood sugar levels are going to be high and this can prevent you from having a good night's sleep. You should have plenty of water though, and we suggest you keep water near your bed. If you wake up dehydrated, it might not matter how many hours you've got, and you might still feel sluggish. Being dehydrated can slow you down. Another thing is to exercise. We're not asking you to start doing 5 mile runs every evening, but just move about a bit in the day. 
Exercise can oxygenate your blood and in turn this provides nutrients to your brain and heart. If you're someone who's very lazy, don't think you'll sleep better because you're so good at not moving. That's not the case at all. We shouldn't have to tell you this, but during the night, turn off alerts on your phone. You might think that you don't hear those beeps, but each beep might upset those deep sleep cycles your body so much enjoys. It's really not hard to turn off those alerts, so start doing it now. Another thing you might not have heard about is not hitting that snooze button. Small increments of sleep do nothing for you at all. It's that good sleep you want. If you enter into a new sleep cycle and then disrupt it after 10 minutes snooze, you're basically ruining that cycle. Your body doesn't like this. The experts tell us there's something called the 90-minute technique, which means setting your alarm 90 minutes before you really want to get up. It's like a long snooze. During those 90 minutes, you'll enter into a REM period, and that's good for you. You could not press the snooze button at all, but some people think it's good to have that early wake-up call. When you wake up, the first thing you want to do is stretch. We mean put some effort into this, and not just do the arms in the air thing. Some people do some easy yoga moves. Why would you do this, you might wonder? The answer is because when you sleep, you're in a state of extreme relaxedness, which isn't far from paralysis. The word for this state is atony. You need to come out of this to feel fresh, but most people just saunter around in the morning. It's been proven that doing a few easy exercises in the morning stimulates your brain and endorphins start rushing in. This will make you feel happier and give you energy. On top of this, hit that cold water as soon as possible. In hot countries, a cold shower might be the thing to do in the morning, but that might not be possible when it's cold outside. Nonetheless, wherever you are, you should splash cold water on your face first thing, not hot water. Some experts say that you should keep a spray bottle next to your bed and spray yourself the moment you wake up. It's a short, sharp shock that will get you going. It might sound silly, but try it and tell us what you think. As for eating in the morning, well, these days a lot of people like to skip breakfast and fast, but there is research that tells us breakfast will give you energy in the morning and will provide you with the energy throughout the day. But if you look online, you'll find a lot of people seem to cope with the day better not eating breakfast while others need their breakfast. We guess you should try both and see what works for you. If you do eat something though, don't go for the sugary stuff. If you do, your blood sugar will spike and then it will drop. You don't need this kind of hit as the come down will slow you down. As for caffeine, some studies have shown that a lot of caffeine can wear a person out later in the day. We're not saying don't drink coffee, but experiment with how you feel drinking certain amounts of it. Coffee before bed is a no-no. Most people think that a coffee a few hours before bed is okay, but the stuff has a half-life of 5-8 to eight hours. Make sure your last coffee is a long time before you plan to sleep. Believe it or not, some studies have shown that if the sun is out, then stick your head out the window and get some. We found a study called Vitalizing Effects of Being Outdoors and in nature. It said participants felt refreshed just looking at nature. So open those curtains in the morning ASAP. If you get some sun on your face, that's good because sunlight can increase serotonin levels. Another thing you should do is some mental accounting first thing. It's simple. Tell yourself what you might find difficult in the day and how you might address that. It's a literal weight off your mind. Now comes the good part because then you should think of at least one thing you're looking forward to that day. People generally don't do this, but they should. It sets the day for you. Be clean. What we mean by this is don't go to bed feeling sweaty or dirty. It could affect how well you sleep. In many Asian countries, people always shower before bed, but it's not the same in other countries. Make sure you go to sleep in a clean and comfortable bed and when you wake up, make sure that you make that bed. Making the bed is like preparing for the day ahead. It shows that you're ready to face the day. On top of this, try to wake up at the same time each day so you maintain your circadian rhythm. If you've never heard of that, it's your sleep-wake cycle. The National Sleep Foundation tells us this about it. The more you pay attention to your body and notice feelings of alertness and drowsiness, and the more time you spend developing good sleep hygiene habits, the better your slumber will be and the better you'll feel. Your body just loves consistency and it will pay you back for it. Before you sleep, it's best not to play games or do anything that might stress you out. For the hour before bedtime, try and do something very relaxing, such as reading a book or just relaxing on the sofa. You shouldn't really be looking at screens right before bedtime because the lights can disrupt the production of melatonin in the brain and this chemical helps you sleep. We shouldn't have to tell you this one, but go to the bathroom before you sleep. Your bladder can fill up in the night and the feeling might wake you up, even if you don't go to the bathroom. You might not feel like you need to urinate, but you 
you'd be surprised how often you can squeeze some out. Always hit the bowl before bed is our advice. Don't hang out in the bedroom before bedtime as much as possible. We know you might like to do this, but your brain should be associating that place with one thing, and that's sleeping. If your bedroom is your castle, you will subconsciously be more energized in that place and it'll be harder to sleep there. As for drinking alcohol, many of you will know that it can help you sleep. Still, it's said booze can interrupt REM sleep and do other bad things, such as give you nightmares. As the booze can relax throat muscles, it can also bring on a bout of snoring, which is not good for sleep. We're sure some of you can attest to the annoyingness of sleeping next to a drunk person. Booze in the system almost always fills the bladder, too, so a trip to the bathroom might be needed during a drunken sleep. Smoking is also not good for sleep, because nicotine increases heart rates and alertness. If you're super addicted, your body might also crave a smoke during the night and wake you up. If you're not willing to give up, we suggest at least trying not to smoke an hour before you go to bed. Colors might be important too. That's at least one study we found undertaken by Travel Lodge. It found that certain colors produced better sleep, and so that's why you might find hotel rooms often being painted or decorated in the same colors. The study found that blue, yellow, and green were the best colors for sleep, while the worst colors were purple and brown. Why? One expert said this, the color blue is associated with feelings of calm, which when picked up by your ganglion cells are relayed to your brain, and help reduce blood pressure and heart rate, all of which help you receive a solid night's sleep. So there you go, paint the bedroom blue, don't drink booze, don't smoke, don't eat too much, and when you wake up, do so with purpose and move around a lot. Wash that face and open those windows. When he was just 12 years old, Martin Pistorius came down with a strange illness that puzzled his parents and doctors and left him in a coma. Doctors told his parents to prepare for the worst, but Martin clung to life in an apparently vegetative state for more than a decade. When Martin miraculously woke up from his coma 12 years later, he remembered everything. He had been trapped in his body, unable to communicate with the world going on around him, but fully aware of everything happening around him and to him for years. Martin's illness started out normally enough. He was suffering from headaches, nausea, and vomiting, symptoms that seemed to point to a common flu. But then, things took a turn for the worse. The formerly rambunctious preteen's personality completely changed. He seemed reserved, slept all the time, and eventually stopped talking and making eye contact altogether. Soon he was unable to feed himself, walk, or even get out of bed. Martin's parents took him to doctor after doctor, but they were just as confused as his parents were. There was no obvious reason for his symptoms, and nothing the doctors tried made Martin feel any better. In fact, he continued to get worse, first becoming wheelchair-bound and eventually slipping into a coma. Martin's doctors were mystified. They weren't exactly sure what caused these mysterious symptoms, but their best guess was an extremely rare case of cryptococcal meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges, the membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. Cryptococcus neoformans, or CM for short, is an incredibly rare form of meningitis, usually diagnosed in people who have compromised immune systems. Early symptoms include headache, nausea, and vomiting, and mental changes like confusion and personality changes. If left untreated, CM can lead to brain damage, coma, and even death. The neoformans fungus that causes most cases of CM is found in soil all over the world particularly soil that contains bird droppings. If a doctor suspects CM based on the patient's symptoms, they'll perform a painful spinal tap to confirm the diagnosis. The infection can be treated with antifungal medication, which usually needs to be taken indefinitely. But since most people who contract CM are already immunocompromised, the infection can often be fatal. In Martin's case, his doctors believed that the infection had run rampant and caused his body to enter a coma state, which led them to believe that his prognosis was not good. After more than two years in a coma, the doctors told Martin's parents that he likely wouldn't ever wake up, and that if he did, he would likely have the mind of a three-year-old. They took him home, made him as comfortable as possible, and did their best to adjust to their new normal. A coma is a state of prolonged unconsciousness characterized by depressed brainstem reflexes. A comatose person's pupils will not respond to light, and their bodies show no response to painful stimuli. A coma can be caused by a head injury, a stroke, a brain tumor, or an underlying illness or infection, as in Martin's case. Most comas last only a few weeks and medical attention is crucial to preserving brain functioning even during that short time. If a coma lasts more than a few weeks, the patient will likely transition to a persistent vegetative state. After more than one year in a coma, it's highly unlikely that the person will wake up. Throughout Martin's ordeal, his parents' life revolved around caring for their comatose son. Every morning, Martin's father would wake up early to dress Martin before dropping him off at the care facility where he spent his days. Eight hours later, after a full day of work, his father would return to pick him up from the facility and bring him home. 
After bathing him and putting him to bed, Martin's father would set his alarm to go off every two hours so that he could get up and turn Martin over to help prevent bed sores. Their lives continued like this for more than a decade, with Martin's parents continuing to love and care for their son despite the fact that doctors had told them that the Martin they knew was gone. At best, they said he had the mind of a three-year-old, and if he was even aware at all. At least that's what they thought. Meanwhile, Martin was aware of everything that was going on around him. About two years after he fell into his coma, Martin's mind woke up, with his intellect fully intact, although the rest of his body remained immobile, and he was trapped in a body that couldn't move, speak, or even make eye contact. But Martin could hear and see everything that was going on around him, and he remembered everything. In one of the care facilities that he spent time at, the staff would dump him in front of a TV playing children's shows for hours on end. Day after day, he sat helpless in front of the TV, with nothing but reruns of the Barney and Friends TV show to focus on. To this day, Martin cannot overstate how much he hates Barney. But annoying kids shows were the least of the abuses he experienced. Everyone around Martin, his parents, his doctors, and the caretakers watching over him all believed that Martin was in a vegetative state, unaware of his surroundings and unable to speak up or protect himself. For some monstrous individuals, Martin appeared to be the perfect victim helpless, silent, and oblivious, and the way they treated him was truly shocking. Martin remembers every detail of the abuse he experienced at a care facility after care facility. Some of the caregivers seemed to get a little too much enjoyment from the act of testing his response to painful stimuli. He remembered being pinched, slapped, and even hit routinely in a way that was clearly not meant to be therapeutic. He was left alone outside in the blistering heat and left wet and shivering for hours after a bath. In one particularly gruesome incident, Martin remembers a nurse feeding him his own vomit as punishment for not being able to stop himself from throwing up after being fed scalding hot food. He even remembers experiencing sexual abuse at the hands of those who were meant to be caring for him and protecting him. But perhaps worst of all was the mental abuse. Thinking that Martin was in a vegetative state and unaware, caregivers would routinely hurl abuse at him. They called him names like freak, dummy, donkey, a heap of rubbish, and those were the milder ones. The lowest point, though, came when his own mother told him she wished he would die. Martin was shocked and hurt. How could his own mother wish death on him? Amazingly, though, Martin was able to use those feelings as fuel and began to take control of his own mind. If he couldn't escape his physical situation, he was going to do his best to escape mentally and preserve whatever sanity he had left. Martin survived the abuse in isolation by learning to disengage his mind. He said, you simply exist, it's a very dark place to find yourself because, in a sense, you're allowing yourself to vanish. Martin developed coping mechanisms, like tracking the sun's shadow as it moved across the room, watching insects, and having conversations with himself in his head. As he strengthened his mind, Martin began to have compassion for his mother and her harsh words. He realized when she looked at him, all she could see was the son she had lost. To her, it was like her son had died when he was 12 years old. Martin could tell she was in pain and often worried that she wasn't a good mother, wasn't taking good enough care of him. The worst part was that Martin could do nothing to ease her fears. Finally, after more than a decade trapped in an immobile body and unable to communicate, Martin experienced the first ray of hope. A new caretaker was compassionate enough to see Martin as a person, not just a body. She actually looked into his eyes and spoke to him, not just at him, and she was the first person in nearly a decade to notice that Martin appeared to show signs of comprehension when she spoke to him. Verna van der Walt would later say that she could tell by the sparkle in his eyes that Martin was conscious and trying to communicate. She managed to convince his parents to take him for extensive cognitive testing, where they got the shock of a lifetime. Martin's mind was perfectly healthy. He was awake and aware, and he remembered everything. This discovery was only the very first step on a long, hard road to recovery, but it was the hope that Martin and his parents had been dreaming of for more than a decade. Martin underwent extreme rehabilitation to begin repairing the damage caused by more than a decade of immobility. After years of inactivity, his muscles had atrophied and he had lost many of his fine motor skills. Martin had to relearn many of the activities of daily living that we take for granted. How to sit up, how to dress and bathe himself, how to feed himself, even how to use his hands. He also had to relearn how to communicate, which he did with the help of a computer. Martin is still confined to a wheelchair and he may never walk again, but he's well on his way to living a full and independent life. In fact, Martin went on to live a shockingly normal life after his ordeal. He graduated university, got a job as a computer programmer, and even married the love of his life. In 2013, Martin wrote a book about his experience called Ghost Boy, The Miraculous Escape of a Misdiagnosed Boy Trapped Inside His Own Body, which became a New York Times bestseller. Talk about an inspirational story. 
While Martin's story seems almost too crazy to believe, some doctors are worried that it's an all too common occurrence. Dr. Adrian Owen is the author of Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the boundary between life and death. Dr. Owen believes that 15-20% to of all patients in persistent vegetative states, or unresponsive wakefulness, are actually conscious and trapped in their own bodies. He spent more than 20 years working with these patients to help better understand the gray zone between consciousness and unconsciousness. In his book, Dr. Owen provides countless examples of patients whose situation is remarkably similar to Martin's. Take Kate, for example, who found herself in a persistent vegetative state after contracting encephalomyelitis, another type of inflammation of the brain and spinal cord tissues. A PET scan showed that Kate's brain responded normally when she was shown pictures of her loved ones. Luckily, Kate recovered from her vegetative state after six months. Another shocking example is the case of Kevin, a 53-year-old bus driver who fell into a coma after suffering a major stroke. FMRI scans showed brain activity consistent with a normal response when Kevin was asked to listen to complex sentences. In another case, a patient named Scott had been comatose for 12 years after a car accident, but his family was adamant that he was still in there. Dr. Owen asked Scott to picture himself playing tennis and the very specific area of our brain associated with playing sports, the premotor cortex, lit up exactly as it would for a healthy person. Scott was even able to answer simple yes or no questions by imagining tennis when the answer was no. Prior to Dr. Owen's work, doctors believed that once someone had been in a persistent vegetative state for a few months, there was zero chance of recovery. This assumption had not only left untold thousands of patients suffering in silence, but it also led to some catastrophic scenarios, like the Venezuelan man named Carlos Camejo who had been unconscious for 10 years following a car accident, only to awaken during his own autopsy. Many people in this situation, like Kate, have even attempted to commit suicide by holding their breath, hoping to exert what little control they had over their own lives. Doctors and researchers are working to better understand the gray zone of consciousness, so that hopefully no one will ever have to go through what Martin, Kate, and the thousands of others trapped in their own bodies had to endure. In the meantime, Martin has some advice for us. Treat everyone with kindness, dignity, compassion, and respect irrespective of whether you think they understand or not. Never underestimate the power of the mind, the importance of love and faith, and never stop dreaming. The bench press is considered a hallmark of all power lifters and a true test of your raw physical strength. With some light training, pretty much any human is able to bench press their own weight. But what about a full-grown male silverback gorilla? How much would a wild gorilla really bench if they were trained to do so? Mountain gorillas are pound for pound one of the strongest animals in the world. In fact, a ranking looking at animal strength versus body weight found that the top four strongest animals in the world were in order. Number one, the dung beetle, which can lift weight up to 1,000 times its own body weight. That would be the equivalent of the average human picking up a small building and chucking it over their shoulder. At number two is the rhinoceros beetle that can grow to six inches and carry weight up to 850 times its own body weight. That would be the equivalent of a human carrying a trained passenger car. At number three is the leafcutter ant, which can carry the weight up to 50 times its own body weight, or the equivalent of a human carrying a not-quite-adult hippopotamus. At number four is the gorilla, capable of carrying objects up to 10 times their own body weight. Gorillas need all this strength in order to defend their group of younger males, females, and babies from wandering predators or other males looking to take over a group for themselves. While rare, fights between big silverbacks are vicious and often end in the death or severe injury to one or both of the animals. Because of their massive strength, it's perhaps surprising then to discover that gorillas actually prefer not to fight and actively engage in threatening displays and false charges to scare away competitors. After all, even if you were a big bad had Silverback in charge, you probably would rather find a more diplomatic solution to a problem than going toe-to-toe -to -toe with another gorilla that has almost as much strength as you. With great power comes great responsibility, but also an extremely high risk of death or injury, and gorillas simply rather not risk it most of the time. In fact, gorillas are amongst some of the most peaceful primates next to bonobos, though they have suffered a maligned reputation around the world thanks to their fearsome displays and massive size. In truth, a wild gorilla would prefer to to avoid a confrontation with you, and if he did charge, it's almost certainly going to be a false charge meant to scare you away. 
Outside of zoos where animals can be extremely depressed or stressed by their living situation, wild gorillas have only ever been recorded attacking humans who were actively hunting them or when in fear of being harmed by the human. But let's say that we wanted to train a gorilla to go for the world record in bench pressing. Well, actually a gorilla would be easily able to beat the world record even without training. But let's say we wanted to figure out what the maximum power of a gorilla would be, because they use their arms for walking around, climbing, punching poachers in the face, and pulling down thick tree branches so they can munch on leaves and fruits, gorillas have seriously more developed arms than humans do. Their upper body strength is around six times greater than the average human, so breaking that record is no problem for even the weakest gorilla. But what would be the maximum a gorilla could be able to lift? Right now, the world record for a raw bench press is 739.6 pounds, set by American Julius Maddox. This isn't the greatest weight ever bench pressed, as those numbers were accomplished with the help of a bench shirt. A bench shirt is a shirt of extremely rigid fabric or materials that artificially moves certain muscles into better positioning, allowing for more lifting potential. Also, we're not interested in having our gorilla cheat. He's going to do things the all-natural way. Also, a lot of those record holders for non-raw presses were never drug tested and once more, we're not going to let our gorilla cheat his way to glory. At one of the latest weigh-ins, Julius weighed a whopping 449 pounds, meaning that he was able to bench press 164% of his body weight. Assuming that with training a gorilla can match the level of fitness Julius has, that means that the average male gorilla, which weighs 430 pounds, would be able to bench press a whopping 4,242 pounds. The largest gorilla on record was an animal shot in 1938 who weighed in at 483 pounds, and if he had been trained to powerlift instead of being shot by idiots, he would have been able to lift an incredible 4,753 pounds. That is a serious amount of lifting potential, and a trained powerlifter gorilla would be able to come in handy when moving day comes around. A Stalin-era scientist once dreamt of creating an army of genetically engineered human-gorilla hybrid soldiers who would have the strength of a gorilla and the intelligence of a man. For us, though, we think this scientist was in the wrong business, because if we used the power of genetic engineering for evil, we would definitely create a moving company made up of hybrid human gorillas who could effortlessly lift furniture over their head. Moving would be a snap, and because they aren't really people, you could much like the average American worker deny them health insurance or benefits of any sort while literally paying them bananas. Imagine doing something boring, like riding the subway or typing away at an expense report, and suddenly your body sends you a very clear message. You need to have sex. Not like a sex fantasy about someone you're attracted to. Rather, you get an intense feeling in your genitals that can only be relieved by sex. You try to ignore it, but it's not going away, and it doesn't care how inappropriate it is for the moment. For a small number of women, this unfortunate situation is reality, and it's one of the rarest and newest sexual disorders out there. Titled Persistent Genital Arousal Disorder, it's not just a one-time thing that makes itself known at an awkward time. This disorder causes sudden and persistent genital arousal without any current sexual stimulation or desire. This unknown disorder was at first mistaken for hypersexuality by puzzled doctors who assumed that this was normal sexual desire gone out of control. But examining a few people who suffered from this condition indicated that it was completely separate from sexual desire. This has led researchers to wonder if the name is appropriate. After all, the women aren't aroused, they are being troubled by a nerve reaction in their genitals that's giving them sensations they don't want. One thing is for sure, the women experiencing this condition all report the symptoms are extreme. When describing the symptoms of the disorder, arousal is the furthest thing from the minds of the sufferers. They feel intense pressure and irritation in their genital area, which can lead to contractions or vaginal congestion. Sometimes spontaneous orgasms can happen, but not in all cases. Sufferers sometimes try to relieve the pressure by masturbating and triggering an orgasm, but this only lasts a short time, if that. Many sufferers report having to have multiple orgasms in a short time to experience any relief, not something that's feasible when it occurs in the middle of a workday. So what causes this bizarre disorder? There are so few cases of persistent genital arousal disorder that no definite cause has been determined yet. Studies indicate that it may be exacerbated by stress, but that's probably not the source of the problem. Originally, doctors assumed it was psychologically based, but attempts to treat the condition through counseling didn't show results. Now it's believed the causes might be neurological or vascular. With conditions like Tarlov cysts or arterial malformations in the pelvic region pressing on a nerve that causes this unusual condition. So what's the solution? 
The women suffering from the condition are desperate for a cure. Treatments have varied, and so has the success rate. Most early cases were treated with a combination of psychotherapy and pelvic exercises, and while the therapy may or may not have been useful, some women report relief from the exercises. In cases where a physical cause can be determined, some minor surgeries have relieved the condition by removing the pressure, but the disorder isn't fully understood yet, and no one's quite sure why a medicine called varenicline, normally used to treat nicotine addiction, relieved one woman's symptoms. But mainly women suffering from the condition have a bigger problem getting anyone to take them seriously. When Jeannie Allen came down with the syndrome in her mid-40s, she was one of the first people ever diagnosed, and she immediately found out that her condition would make her the subject of mockery. One of the first doctors she talked to even commented that she must be every man's dream, to which she snapped back that he should try to imagine what it would be like to have an orgasm every minute of the day. She was so frustrated that she eventually went public under the pen name Jean Lund and became one of the first people to ever share exactly what it was like to live with this condition long term. She described it as taking the joy out of life and leaving her unable to concentrate on anything else. Another woman, a 40-year-old flower vendor who became the subject of an early clinical study, reported that the episodes happened spontaneously with no trigger and left her exhausted and unable to plan her day effectively. She had previously had an attack of the condition seven years before and found relief after a surgery that removed a ruptured ovary. But now it was back, and the doctors were as clueless as she was. They tried the medicine carbamazepine, an anticonvulsant on her, and she stopped after a month due to lack of improvement. However, in her case, supportive therapy sessions seemed to do the trick as they reduced the frequency of symptoms, and she was eventually able to resume a normal life. Causes might vary, but one medical condition repeats as likely cause of the condition. What is a Tarlov cyst? The human body is sensitive with a lot of little areas that can go awry, and even the smallest problem can have unexpected consequences. The Tarlov cysts are tiny cysts in the spinal canal near the base of the spinal cord and are known for their walls filled with nerve fibers. First discovered by Isidore Tarlov in 1938, he at first assumed them not to cause any adverse symptoms. However, future investigations indicated they can cause pain, spasticity and muscle weakness, headaches and bladder dysfunction among other symptoms. They can wreak havoc on the nervous system and create unpredictable symptoms, including genital dysfunction as they happen to be right by the nerves that affect the genitals. When Professor Barry Komisaruk, one of the first researchers investigating persistent genital arousal syndrome, looked at the MRIs of sufferers, he was shocked to discover that two-thirds of them had Tarlov cysts. So there may finally be hope for the women being driven crazy by this strange disorder. Eleven women with the disorder had their Tarlov cysts operated on by Dr. Feigenbaum, a spinal neurosurgeon who had been studying the disorder. They became part of a case study on the disorder, and when they were interviewed after their recovery, eight of the eleven said their symptoms had gone away. The remaining three reported significant relief from before surgery, and this was the best evidence yet that sacral nerve compression was the root cause of the disorder. But not all cases of the disorder have the cysts, and not all people who improve have the surgery. And for Jeannie Allen, these advances weren't much help. She never had a Tarlov cyst, and doctors were at a loss for how to treat her. She eventually quit her job to dedicate herself to advocating for more research and support for women with her condition. Despite the growing awareness, it's still a very rare disorder. While it's believed hundreds of women may suffer from the condition, case studies have only looked at a population of under 30 women. How is the growing awareness of this disorder helping these women? For the first time, women suffering from this strange disorder have a source for help other than doctors who may not fully understand it. They can find fellow sufferers online to learn how they've been coping. This allows them to try various solutions including exercise, meditation, and medication that may or may not be helpful. While many find surgery as a solution, local anesthetic hasn't been successful in preventing the disorder. While the intense feeling is concentrated in one specific area, it doesn't originate there. It's generated in the nervous system, and any solution has to go deeper than skin deep. Persistent genital arousal disorder only affects those with a certain set of equipment, so those with the other set have to be breathing a sigh of relief, right? Not exactly. There's a similar condition that affects men, and it may be even more challenging and uncomfortable. It's called priapism, and it causes similar persistent arousal of the genitals that manifests as a prolonged, uncomfortable erection that persists even in the absence of any stimulation. Most men remember that awkward moment when you really can't stand up because the bulge in your pants has decided to make itself known, but this is an extended erection that can make it difficult to walk, urinate, or concentrate. 
Like persistent genital arousal disorder, it can be caused by a number of things including sickle cell disease, nerve damage, drug use, or trauma to the penis. Another reason to be wary of getting kicked in the genitals. So is there any good news for those suffering from this uncomfortable condition? Well, preopism is more common than persistent genital arousal disorder, and doctors know a lot more about how to treat it. Unfortunately, it also carries more health risks. An erection that lasts too long can cause serious damage, as many ads for erectile dysfunction medication have warned. As most cases of preopism are caused by the inability of the penis to drain blood properly, the most common treatment is to numb the area and drain it with a minimally invasive procedure. If blood drainage isn't a problem, treating it can be as easy as a cold compress. But in a worst-case scenario, surgery may be performed, and the clock is ticking. Permanent damage can begin after only four hours. It's an embarrassing but not uncommon medical problem. It's estimated that it may occur in as many as 1 in 20,000 men a year. These have got to be some of the strangest sexual disorders to encounter, right? Not quite. Doctors have encountered some genuinely bizarre sexual disorders, some of which they don't have a real answer for yet. One of the most troubling sexual disorders is retrograde ejaculation, which has terrified quite a few couples. In this disorder, everything goes perfectly normally until it's time for the guy to ejaculate. It feels like everything went fine, but nothing's come out. This is a rare disorder caused by a malfunctioning valve between the urethra and the bladder where the semen doesn't travel down the escape hatch and instead shoots backwards into the bladder. It can make it difficult to conceive, but doesn't really have any serious health risks. The usual culprit? A side effect from medication. There are a few other things better than post-sex bliss, right? Not for the people with the next condition. Post-orgasmic illness syndrome is another condition that's puzzled doctors. For those few men suffering from it, whenever they ejaculate, they immediately come down with a series of flu-like symptoms. That pleasant feeling of an orgasm is immediately replaced by a feverish feeling, a runny nose, and the intense need to lie down. Not exactly a happy ending, and the cause might be even more bizarre. According to Dr. Marcel Waldinger, one of the few doctors to study this condition, the men might be allergic to their own semen. This has led doctors to experiment with a cure by injecting these men with a diluted solution made from their own sperm. Most of these conditions only manifest during or after sex, but this next one might be painfully obvious much earlier. Phimosis is a malformation of the foreskin surrounding the penis that makes it too tight, essentially forming a band around the tip that can make sex or any other pressure on the penis extremely painful. The disorder exists from birth but only becomes obvious when someone tries to have sex or masturbate. The good news is this disorder isn't nearly as mysterious as others. It's a simple skin problem and can be corrected by a circumcision procedure that's slightly more extensive than average, removing all the foreskin instead of only a part. The biggest challenge for the sufferers? Going to the doctor and admitting this embarrassing problem. The next disorder might sound less terrifying than the others, but it can make for some awkward conversations. Due to a problem during the development of a fetus, it's possible for male children to be born with two penises called diphalia. This is a rare condition that's most surprising for the fact that in some cases both penises function for both urination and ejaculation. One is usually smaller than the other, but that's the only distinction. The disorder can also manifest as a part of larger developmental abnormalities that require surgical intervention, and each case is handled independently as doctors figure out an approach that will lead to the most normal life for the affected child. It's rare for adults with diphalia who have not had the condition treated to be found, so unpleasant surprises in the bedroom are unlikely. With many sexual disorders like persistent genital arousal disorder, doctors are often unsure of whether the cause is physical, psychological, or due to side effects from an exterior stimulus. That's why those suffering from these rare disorders often find that their fellow sufferers are the best source of information as everyone tries to puzzle out these weird quirks of human sexuality. We've talked about what happens when you die, an episode that was very popular. Now we tackle a similar question, what happens just before you die? This question comes to us from Jody. As you may already know, we love answering questions from you, our beloved viewers. So today, as per Jody's request, we dare to venture deep into the subject in our quest to find out if your life really does flash before your eyes in your final moment. To begin with, we'll start with what happens to you physically, depending on how you die. Let's first talk about drowning. This is a very uncomfortable death, characterized by an inability to breathe that leads to your demise underwater. 
What happens is that you struggle with your mouth below the surface, you panic and might begin to aspirate and inhale water. This leads you to having a laryngospasm which happens when your vocal cords close and block airways in an attempt to protect your lungs. When this happens, you're unable to scream for help, thus drowning is mostly a silent death. When not enough oxygen reaches the body's tissues, you then go through something known as hypoxia. You become unconscious and your airway relaxes, which allows your lungs to fill up with water. Prolonged time without air can lead to cardiac arrest and brain damage before finally leading to death. This is not a good way to go, so it's highly recommended that you wear a life vest if you don't know how to swim. Either that or keep an inflatable pool toy under you. The unicorn floaty is all the rage right now, get one with a cup holder while you're at it, so you can keep a martini on hand. Death by hypothermia, where the core body temperature drops to a dangerous level, causes you to shiver intensely. After extended exposure to freezing temperatures, your body functions start to slow down, including your respiration, heart, and metabolic rates. You then lose consciousness before you die. An example of this type of death would include what happened to Jack in the movie Titanic. Spoiler alert, we saw him turn into a human popsicle before he sunk dramatically into the dark depths of the Atlantic. Rose let go of him in the moment after saying she wouldn't. What's up with that? We feel that we need to add that Jack could have easily fit onto the door that was used as a raft. He just didn't try hard enough. At any rate, you definitely wouldn't want to perish in icy cold waters this way. It's not a fun way to go, especially if you hate the cold. On the opposite end of the spectrum, death by burning has to be a very horrifying way to meet your demise. Sometimes when people were burned at the stake back in the dark ages, they would die from carbon monoxide poisoning before the flames completely consumed them. This happens when you breathe in too much carbon. It's definitely not a pleasant way to go. In fact, it's excruciatingly painful. Yet carbon monoxide poisoning would have been considered a merciful death in comparison to feeling a fire melt away your flesh. The human body can burn for several hours, but if you're lucky, you're already dead by the time the dermis cracks. The dermis, in case you didn't know, is the thick layer of skin under the epidermis, which is the thin layer of outer skin. Sometimes burns can cause so much damage to your nerves that you're no longer able to detect pain. More than likely, however, you've already died before you can recognize that you don't feel pain anymore. The initial agony of being burned alive can also be so intense that some people may die of primary shock, when blood pressure drops so low that vital organs can no longer function. Suffocation from the fumes and heat stroke can also result in death before the actual flames do the job. With heat stroke, your brain and other vital organs swell, which can be fatal if left untreated. Now that we've covered some of the extreme, horrific, morbid aspects of physical causes of death and what happens to the body before dying, let's explore what might happen mentally before you die. We mean aside from the obvious panic you might experience if you're aware of what's happening to you. This is a big topic because there are a lot of strange and abnormal things people claim to have happened in the moments just before death. Neurologist Dr. Cameron Shaw believes he knows exactly what happens to us 30 seconds before we meet the Grim Reaper. He's dissected a woman's brain in order to find out what was going on immediately before she died. What he found was chilling. First, he says, we lose our sense of self. This reportedly is because the brain tends to die from the top down, and blood supply is gathered from underneath. Thus, the prefrontal cortex, the part responsible for cognition, planning, personality, decision making, and moderating social behavior, loses blood first as the brain drains. This implies that our sense of self, sense of humor, and our ability to think ahead all dissipates within the first 10 to 20 seconds out of the 30 second countdown to death. Then Dr. Shaw explains, as the wave of blood-starved brain cells spread out, our memories and language centers short out, and we're left with just a core. By this point, you have no awareness of what's happening. Not to be overly grim, but you basically shut down, go blank, fall into the dark pit of nothingness, whatever you prefer to call it. Dr. Shaw says that you do see a white light at the end of a tunnel before you die, but not necessarily because you're drifting into heaven. We hate to break it to you, but Dr. Shaw says this happens when the sudden loss of blood supply to the brain causes tunnel vision. The first thing that's noticed is a feeling of being faint, as well as the narrowing of your vision, which is followed by an ominous or peaceful darkness depending on how you perceive it. But it all has to do with the loss of blood to your head. Dr. Shaw also explains the concept of the out-of-body experience, which many Many people have claimed to have been through during life-threatening near-death experiences. This is said to happen when people perceive themselves to be floating through the air like a spirit, ghost, or apparition. They see objects in another room or the tops of people's heads from an aerial view. Dr. Shaw that this is just a trick of the mind and that it's not real. He claims that the out-of-body experience is little more than a myth. He says, quote, the brain can create a visual world around you that resembles something close to reality that isn't reality because you're actually blind. 
What we think he means by this is that you're blind to your surroundings while in this state of mind because you're basically unconscious. Some people who have experienced the out-of-body sensation, however, will continue to assert that this was very real to them. Many will jump to its defense. Now, what about the question regarding whether your life flashes before your eyes? You may be interested to know that yes, indeed it does, but not in the way you think. What we mean to say is that you won't visualize yourself as a baby and watch yourself grow up. It doesn't happen chronologically like in the movies. You'll simply witness key memories randomly based on importance and which events sparked the greatest emotion for you. In the final moments, you'll think about the most notable or prominent moments of your life. The most memorable aspects of your existence pop into your thoughts. Your first kiss, graduation, holidays with your family, the day you got married to your spouse, the day your first child was born, and more. Some people who have experienced this near-death occurrence say that many memories were packed into a short period of time. Some have even gone so far as to say that it felt like centuries had passed while they were witnessing the memories of their lives play out before them like a movie across a screen. One person claimed being able to actually feel what friends and family members felt through each memory. The same person was quoted in an article in The Sun saying, I was allowed to see part of them and feel for myself what they felt. In essence, empathy for others was said to be directly experienced during this ordeal. Perhaps this was to teach a life lesson about consideration for others. Philosophically, we can only speculate. Now, Dr. Cameron Shaw is not the first or last professional to study what happens before you die. And if you watched our video called Did Scientists Really Find a Way to Bring the Dead Back to Life? Then you may have learned that a study on pig brains revealed that the organ can continue to function cellularly after pronounced clinically dead. This means that it's theoretically possible to be partially dead or partially alive. Creepy. In all likelihood, however, you're not conscious enough to realize that you are somewhat dead. For those who have ever been around someone with a terminal illness in their final moments of life, often it's said that a loss of consciousness is the first physical change to occur. Still, even while unconscious, the person might still be able to hear or feel you. After consciousness goes, there may be changes to the skin, where it becomes slightly blue in color. Breathing may become loud as mucus builds up in the throat. As the end draws nearer, shallow breathing may stop and start again between breaths. This is known as chain stokes breathing. It can last for a short or long time before finally stopping entirely. During the bodily transition to death, it's likely that you're not distressed or in pain because you're not aware that you're dying. For this reason, many believe that the changeover is relatively peaceful because, as the common saying goes, ignorance is bliss. Some people choose when and where to die and are able to hang on a little longer until a loved one arrives at their bedside. Others may not be so lucky and may be unable to control when they go. Many people often feel guilty for not being there at the precise moment when their loved one passed. They might feel like they let the person down by missing the crucial moment. It might be of comfort to know that the person was probably not aware of your absence when they passed. Still, if friends or family members are distressed by the passing of their loved one, they're usually referred to consult with a bereavement counselor who's trained in helping people who are undergoing these exact situations. Counselors can be very helpful and beneficial with assisting people through the difficult grieving process. Receiving bereavement support is important, and we'd strongly recommend doing so if you've just lost someone close to you. So you say you don't sleep well and you don't know why because you feel good and you do all the right things in your life to get a decent night's sleep. What you don't know is that you actually don't do the things that are conducive to getting a solid 8 hours with those needed spurts of rapid eye movement. There are things you do that you're not even aware of that affect you getting the requisite hours in a deep sleep mode. And today we're going to tell you what you're doing wrong. So first of all, you're not alone. Did you know that in the USA it's reported that a whopping 60% of people have trouble sleeping most nights or even every night? That's according to the National Sleep Foundation. And when it comes to sleeping, this organization knows what it's talking about. The same study tells us that 43% of those people rarely or never get a good night's sleep. Well, at least people aged 13 to 64. A lot of those folks say they don't even get 6 hours of sleep a night. And the word on the street is, we should get 7 to 9 hours if we want to feel good. The sleep deprivation era is here, and there is one big reason why we seem to be sleeping less. The reason is technology. With the National Sleep Foundation reporting that 95% of people use an electronic gadget of some kind right before bed. Hmm, are you watching this show just before you intend to sleep? But we're not just talking about phones. TVs are included in the list of gadgets. This is what one expert said about gadget use before bed. Artificial light exposure between dusk and the time we go to bed at night suppresses release of the sleep-promoting hormone melatonin. 
enhances alertness and shifts circadian rhythms to a later hour, making it more difficult to fall asleep. We're not saying don't use gadgets, but perhaps if you want to get your 8 hours and drift off quickly, you might think about not looking at a screen for the 2 hours before you intend to sleep. Around 60% of people in one study said they use their laptop or phone right before they go to bed, and some of them play computer games, which is really not conducive to making yourself tired. Another sleep expert said this about that. Over the last 50 years, we've seen how television viewing has grown to be near constant before bed. And now we're seeing new information technologies such as laptops, cell phones, video games, and music devices rapidly gaining the same status. You might think it doesn't affect you at all, but according to these experts, it does and there's data to back that up. We should add that the artificial light theory about keeping us awake is controversial, and so more research needs to be done. According to studies, a lot of Americans leave their phone alerts on during the night, and 1 in 10 people interviewed said their phone woke them up during the night at times. Just turn off the alerts, it's simple to do. The problem these days is that many people have online friends all over the world, so when you're trying to sleep in the UK, your friends in the USA are sending you photos of kittens on Facebook Messenger. You might have a client in Asia who keeps posting stuff about the work you do when you're trying to sleep in Canada. You may wake up and not know why, but often it's because something went down in that phone of yours. Another study said younger folks were terrible at this, saying that 72% of American kids aged 6 to 17 go to bed with their phone. In the past, kids may have slept with a furry bear or a book, and those things don't make any noise. So why do people these days feel they need to sleep with their phone? What's so important that it can't wait? Are you really that addicted to the thing? The co-founder of Huffington Post, Ariana Huffington, has said in interviews that this tech addiction is a major issue and is affecting the mental health of people. She said the parents are often as bad as the kids, so they need to start setting a better example. She talks about the dopamine hits we get from technology, and so scrolling through Facebook right before bed is not a good idea. When she sleeps, there's no technology in her room at all. You might also get stressed by looking at social media before bedtime. You really don't want to get a shot of envy right before you try to fall asleep. Oh look, there's my friend on a beach in some country I can't afford to go to. That's not what you want in your head before you try to fall asleep. So technology, this is what's keeping you awake. Our advice is simple. Do not look at any electronic screens at least two hours before bedtime. You might not believe it, but it's negatively affecting your sleep cycle. If you're a parent, don't allow tech in your kids' bedrooms. If you're a kid, wise up and turn that stuff off. Show some self-control. And if we're starting to sound like we're giving you a lecture, we should say that we only just started doing this ourselves. We can tell you that we started to sleep better. Now let's say you don't use an electronic gadget, but still can't sleep. You're not depressed or particularly stressed, and so you don't know what the problem is. You haven't just fallen in love or lost a job. You're fine, but sleeping is hard work for you. You know, it could be those coffees that you're having in the evening, or perhaps those cups of tea. We know those British folks love their tea, and quite a few of them will have a cuppa in the evening, perhaps with their suppa. We know this because we've seen it firsthand. That cup of the finest Tetley's tea could actually be keeping those Brits awake. That cappuccino from Starbucks the American had at 7 p.m. could ruin that person's sleep. This is the lowdown on the drug, caffeine. Once you've had your hit, you'll peak around 30 to 60 minutes later. That buzz will then plateau, but caffeine has a half-life of 5 to 6 hours, meaning this is the time it takes for your body to get rid of half of the drug. Still, you have some caffeine in your system for hours after that. Now, as you know, it's not as if caffeine can be compared to a substance such as ice, the illegal kind. But it is a stimulant, and we should say that Americans love the stuff perhaps just as much as those Brits love their tea. One study we found said this, the average daily consumption of caffeine by adults in the US is about 300 mg per person. This is about three times higher than the world average, but it's still only half of the caffeine consumption in heavy tea drinking countries such as England and Sweden. Some people like coffee too much, and while there are many positive effects to having that shot of espresso, you can go overboard. In extreme cases, believe it or not, people have died from overdosing on caffeine. In less extreme cases, people just feel weird. That might not be so bad in the morning, but at nighttime it can be a nightmare. You can look at coffee charts from Starbucks or other outlets and see how much caffeine there is in one cup. It depends on the size of the cup, but your instant stuff might just have 50 milligrams of caffeine in it, which isn't going to make you fire up some techno music and start dancing. But many outlets sell cups of coffee with 200 or even 400 milligrams of caffeine in the cup. The Starbucks Blonde Roast has a massive 475 milligrams of caffeine in it. Some experts say when you get a hit of 500 
500 to 600 milligrams, it's like a small dose of amphetamine. Tea drinkers will fare better as a regular cup might only contain 50 milligrams of caffeine, but given some folks drink tea as if they were addicted to it, it's possible to get a tea high. The long and short of this all is that you really shouldn't be consuming caffeine in the evening at all. We suggest you have your last hit in the afternoon. We found one study that told us having caffeine six hours before bedtime reduced people's sleep time by one hour. Energy drinks also contain caffeine, and so those 10 vodka Red Bulls you had at the party might not only just make you act like an idiot, but it will likely cut down on your sleep time. A can of Coke will have caffeine in it if it's not the non-caffeine variety, so remember that some soft drinks before bed might not be a good thing. The US Food and Drug Administration tells us that caffeine is for the most part a safe substance, but it says you should probably not consume more than 400 mg a day. That's easy to do when you're chugging tea and coffee all day and then having your Cokes for lunch and dinner. What about eating late at night? Some studies tell us that late eaters might gain weight because you're hardly active when you're sleeping. Another study conducted in the University of Pennsylvania in 2017 said eating late at night gives people a higher chance of getting type 2 diabetes. The study said late eating can raise cholesterol levels and so give you a better chance of having a heart attack. In fact, there isn't much happy information concerning eating late, but lots of people do it. Imagine this, some kid munching on a bag of Doritos while drinking a Coke and scrolling through envy-inducing Facebook right before that kid wants to sleep. That makes about as much sense as someone going to a nightclub to meditate or heading to the shooting range to study for their calculus exam. It makes no sense at all, but people do it. We imagine a few of you are doing something like that right now, but you can admit to it later. At nighttime, give your digestive system a break. There's evidence that it's not only bad for your health, but food in your full stomach can affect how much quality sleep you get. If you watched our other sleep show, you'll know that the good kind of sleep is when you go into deep sleep and these are called rapid eye movement cycles. You should be getting about five of these a night. The other sleep is called non-rapid eye movement. Studies have shown that food before bed can reduce these deep sleep cycles and prevent you from having the dreams that are so important to your mental well-being. Sugar, carbs, and fats are the worst things to eat late at night, so perhaps we'll forgive you for having one small bite of banana. This is the conclusion of one article we found. Eating during bedtime hours, whether it's a large dinner or a small snack, while watching your favorite TV show, while it may seem to help you fall asleep, may actually harm your overall health and metabolism, creating added stress inside the body. So there you go. If you're healthy and not suffering from some physical or mental disease, this might be the reason you're not sleeping well. It's really simple advice to follow. Just turn off your gadgets two hours before bed. Don't consume caffeine at least six hours before bed, and don't eat before you sleep. If indeed you're watching the show at midnight with your mouth full of chocolate being cement mixed with Coca-Cola, you're basically creating a perfect storm of bad sleep. I wouldn't go so far to say that I'm a fitness freak. But I do like to keep fit. Right now I'm stuck in my house and I've been told to self-quarantine so that means no gym, no running in the local park, and I've even retired my bicycle for the time being. What I've done though is created a workout that anyone can do and they can do it in their own house. It requires no equipment and it isn't even that hard to do. It's what I'd call my solitary confinement workout and in the interests of helping people stay healthy, I'd like to share it with you. You might find that you've come out of your isolation feeling and looking better than you have in years. Ok, so I'm going to start with exercises everyone can do. I realize some of you might not be gym rats, but I promise you, you can do the following exercises and you'll feel better for it. Remember that self-isolation can get a person down, as can tsunamis of bad news, so this should help make you feel better mentally too. We'll tell you at the end how you can make these workouts actually really good fun and something that that'll put you and your buddies in the best of moods. Let's just say we know how to do this because we listen to prisoners and it makes their days a lot easier. Ok, so one thing everyone can do is planking. You can even do this while you're watching TV or watching this video, and it's one of the greatest things in the exercise world. It's the true every man and every woman's exercise. Why do it, you might ask? Well, it strengthens the core of your body, and if you're into fitness, you'll hear people talking about the core all the time. It's just the midsection of your body. But it'll also strengthen your arms, legs, shoulders, and back. It's kind of the go-to exercise if you're not that fit. Plank for a few seconds and before you know it, you'll be more capable of doing things like push-ups. Ok, so some of you are thinking, geez, I can't even hold a plank. Ok, so at first, don't do the whole plank and let your knees rest on the ground. 
the next time try pulling them up for a bit. If you can plank for 2 seconds, well done. Then go for 3 seconds. If you can plank for a minute, well you're already pretty strong, but then don't do 1 minute a day. Rest a while, then do 10 1 minute planks a day. And guys, we are not trying to sell you some sketchy get fit quick program. Planking works, it's an excellent way to strengthen your body. Like we said, don't feel down if you can't do it at first. Aim for 1 second, then 2 seconds. If you aim too high, you'll just give up. Never set the bar too high. Once you get better, you can switch it up a bit, like doing it on your side. We could almost stop there because planking really is that good for you. We're not going to talk too much about push-ups or sit-ups because you already know all about those exercises. We will say, though, that we know some guys in prison will go over the top. That means just doing as many push-ups or sit-ups as possible until your heart is beating super fast. But just a word of advice here, only do this if you're fit already. We don't want anyone getting injured, especially when the healthcare system is already stretched thin. Only push yourself when you're already good at a particular exercise. And wow, those endorphins. You'll soon stop being depressed about what you see on the news. And as an added bonus, you'll be fit and your immune system will be in better shape. Ok, another caveat, if you work out so much that you feel ill, there's potential it will have the opposite effect and compromise your immune system, so be sensible. Ok, another great in-room exercise is the squat. This will strengthen your legs and glutes and more, and also make your joints stronger. Before I started doing squats, I would struggle to pick up a coin on the ground. Now I can bend down like a beautiful, graceful ballerina. Again, start slow if you're not that fit, go down ever so slightly and keep a straight back and your knees behind your toes. Then push off your heels, repeat until you're tired. For those of you thinking that's just too easy, try a pistol squat which means going down on just one leg and the other leg points forward. You have to maintain your balance and many of you will find out this is not an easy exercise. But if for some of you strong guys that's still too easy, do it with weight in your hands. If you don't have any weights or other equipment in your house and want to get stronger, you can just use household items. Try using bags of rice, plastic bottles of water, heavy books. But maybe squats are too hard for you? Start with something called a wall sit. Yeah, you just sit against the wall as if you were in a chair, but obviously there's no chair. Do this for as long as you can. You'll know your limit because your knees will start to tremble. If you want to make this exercise even harder, you can raise one of your legs off the ground. Do the same again except raise the other leg off the ground. But again, this is an expert level wall sit, so don't be discouraged if you can't do it straight away. Ok, so you're wanting to do more cardio type exercises that increase your heart rate even though you're stuck inside and don't have room to run? One quite easy cardio exercise is simply standing up straight and pulling up your leg so your knee touches your hand. Then do the same thing with the other leg. And if that's really easy for you, keep doing it and do it until you feel tired. When you're doing this fast, it might feel a bit like you're dancing or hopping. Do it for 2 minutes, take a short break and then do it again. This will strengthen your core and it will give your heart a good workout if you're doing it fast. It's also a good warm up routine, a favorite for folks that do the 20 minute workout videos online. Now if you really feel up to it and can do the things we've already discussed, you'll want to do one of the best indoor exercises known to man and it's called the burpee. This will strengthen multiple muscles at once and make you super fit. It's almost a total body exercise all on its own. We should say though, it's not that easy. And so if your workout routine up to now has consisted of walking to the car or squatting on the toilet, don't try burpees before you've planked for a while or are ok at push ups and have done some of those wall sits. It's up to you, but you can also add a push up to your burpee when you drop down for extra challenge. It might look easy to some of you, but just try doing 10 burpees in a row. If that's no trouble, try doing 20. If it's really that hard for you to do, do them slowly and don't jump at the end. Work up to that and have a towel at hand because you will sweat a lot. This next one has the best exercise name of all time. It's called the up dog down dog exercise. You'll start in the push up position then move your body until your bottom is in the air and you look like an upside down V. Now you're an up dog. The next part is basically going back down until your legs are almost flat to the floor. Your chest is straight and your head is looking right up. Ok, so that doesn't look too hard to you, but it's such a good exercise when it comes to your mobility. If you sit at a desk all day, you might start to hunch from time to time, but this exercise will straighten you right out. Next up are lunges, which basically consist of lunging forward, hence the name. Keep your chest up and your back straight and look straight forward. You can try first with your left foot forward and then do it with your right foot forward. You can of course add stuff to this like doing a star jump at the end of the lunge. This will tire you out fast. Some very fit people will jump from lunge to lunge many times over, but that's certainly not for beginners. You're going to see fitness websites telling you to do 20 reps or so, but just try to do one lunge at the start and build up, only doing as much as you feel comfortable with. Again, now is not the time for any of us to be getting injured. 
Now we've got another great exercise for you, but one that you will do only when you are already in pretty good shape, and it's called the mountain climber. You'll need to get into the push-up position, or look like the sprinters do when they're waiting for the starting pistol to go off. One leg will be fully extended and the other one bent forward. You then explosively jump so that your legs have switched positions. As with burpees, this exercise is for people who've already mastered the easier ones we've talked about. Next are dips, and all you need for those is a chair and a table. These are pretty hard too, so make sure you're strong enough before you injure yourself or break something in your house. You don't really need two objects either, you can dip from any solid surface. Note the word solid. Don't dip off your grandma's fragile antique coffee table or a wobbly chair. Ok, so we realize that some of you are thinking right now, thanks Infographic Show, these really are exercises I could do at home, but you know what? I know I won't do any of this. Well, you've just got to make it fun. What this writer does is award himself after a workout. You want to have a nice cup of coffee? Well, you can have that after 20 burpees. You want to watch that next episode on Netflix? That'll cost push-ups and sit-ups and 30 seconds against the wall. You should also mix up your session from day to day. Fun way to do that is to choose four of the exercises we've talked about today, then get a pack of playing cards. This is what some people in prison call the deck of pain. Maybe one day hearts will be squats with a jump, clubs will be lunges, diamonds will be 5 second planks, and spades will be sit ups. You then pick a card, any card, and if it's the 7 of hearts you'll have to do 7 squats. If you pull a 10 of diamonds that'll be a 50 second plank. Jacks are 11, queens are 12, and kings are 13. If you pull an ace, that means you'll do the exercise to your maximum ability until you give up. Trust us, an ace of burpees is some workout session. Better still, do this with someone else, and you pick their card. Oh, it's so much fun when you pull an ace for them. That might sound sadistic, but in the end it's all fun and it'll make you both fitter than you've ever been. Of course, if you're isolating, doing it with someone else can be hard, but try doing it over video chat with someone else. Not only will this cheer you up and your buddy up, but you'll be doing yourself a big favor. You can get amazingly fit in a small confined area. Just ask Britain's most notorious prisoner, one Charles Arthur Salvador aka Charles Bronson, who set workout records and gained an almost superhuman strength during his very long incarceration. He claimed he could do 1,727 push-ups in an hour at the age of almost 50, and his book Solitary Fitness is still sold today. Have you ever suffered from insomnia? Twisting and turning between the sheets until you see the light peeking through the curtains and you think, damn, today is not going to be easy? For most people who go without sleep for just one night, the next day everything seems a bit out of whack. Imagine that lasted another day, and another day. That's what we're going to discuss in this episode of the Infographic Show, What If You Never Fell Asleep Again? Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of a notification squad. Let's start with day one of no sleep. What exactly happens to you? According to one study that tested volunteers' brain patterns after a sleepless night, the deprivation led to what is called fractional anisotropy. In layman's terms, this means sleeplessness affects neural functions and in the short term can affect your emotions as well as your ability to think straight. One sleep expert, Dr. Fred Merkula, says going without just one night's sleep can affect the brain the same way alcohol does, by creating mental confusion. He also says that going just 24 hours without sleep can result in hallucinations, paranoia, and even sleep deprivation psychosis. The Journal of Neuroscience says this can feel like suffering from schizophrenia for some people, while others deal with a 24-hour wake binge much better. If one night can be that bad, what about two nights? Most scientists that study sleep deprivation say you lose 25% of brain performance for every 24 hours you don't sleep. If after 24 hours you feel muddled and a little off kilter, a report by the US National Institute of Health says that after 39 hours your heart rate and blood pressure will be affected. At this point you may have all the symptoms above, but according to research there is a good chance you'll have trouble remembering some people's faces. After 48 hours the body's immune system starts to falter due to a decrease in your body's natural killer cells aka NK cells. These are the cells that fight off disease. The study abstract concludes, not surprisingly, that sleep restriction produces physiological consequences that may be unhealthy. Nitrogen was also found in the urine of the test patients, which also usually means your body is undergoing some kind of stress. It's also proven that your hormones will be affected, so there's a chance you might get all emotional or just fly off the handle. Your hearing as well as hand-eye coordination will be affected, and so will your ability to judge situations. According to the International Journal of Occupational Medicine and Environmental Health, don't drive a car at this point or start doing some metal work. You may just start using a kind of autopilot too, meaning you get from A to B and don't remember what happened in between. As for the mind, on one particular web forum, a high school student says he went to school after 48 hours of no sleep and ended up sitting down on a bench and chatting with another boy. When he noticed a concerned teacher looking at him, he then realized there was no boy there. He had been hallucinating. In an article by Everyday Health, it states at 48 hours you will also start having microsleeps. 
These can last between half a second to half a minute, and you won't even know you've had them. Other research says that you are not actually hallucinating, but dreaming during wakefulness. This is something that has been called sleep insanity. At 72 hours, things get really weird. When interviewed, one soldier who experienced days without sleep said even just talking to someone can be really hard. He also said he'd see things in the trees, such as people approaching his camp. It's interesting to note here that during Navy SEAL training, there is something called Hell Week, wherein trainees have to stay awake for as long as they can and actually do things. According to the Navy SEAL's website, only 25% of people get through Hell Week, but it does seem they can catch at least a couple of Z's now and again. Unless under lab conditions are being tortured, we will all have these microsleeps or blackouts. As for torture, the Senate Committee's 2014 report on the CIA's use of sleep deprivation after 9-11 found that depriving people of sleep made them say just about anything, including false confessions. The report said some detainees were sleep deprived for as long as 180 hours, which resulted in them being put under tremendous physical and emotional stress, as well as experiencing disturbing hallucinations. Amnesty International calls it cruel and inhumane, not only for what happens psychologically, but also the stress that is put on the body. The record for not sleeping without the use of stimulants is held by Randy Gardner and he managed 11 days, 25 minutes in 1964. He suffered from concentration problems, short-term memory loss, paranoia, and hallucinations. Claims have been made for longer sleeps, but none have been scientifically verified. If you are unfortunate enough to suffer from the disease fatal familial insomnia, you will not sleep, and as the name suggests, you will die within months, but not before you go crazy. No one has ever just stayed awake, as it is thought to be simply impossible, you will just start having micro sleeps. We don't know what would happen to someone who never sleeps again because the body, thank goodness, just won't let that happen. We all know what it's like to be hungry, maybe even really, really hungry. Your stomach growls, you might get a little lightheaded, your body's doing everything it can to tell you that it's time to drop whatever you're doing and grab a snack. It's a minor inconvenience that we all must live with, unless you're a robot or a human with cybernetic stomach that runs on cold fusion. But that's a subject for another episode. If you're too lazy to cook, maybe you pop a frozen dinner in the microwave or resort to a cup of ramen noodles. Whatever your case may be, your munching quickly satisfies your demanding stomach and you can move on with your day. But what if you had to endure that sensation of hunger for a longer period of time? What's it like to experience starvation? And how long can you go without eating? Now, just to be clear, we wouldn't recommend that you go home after watching this episode and attempt to stop eating. That would not be a very good idea. If you do decide that you want to challenge yourself, please consult your doctor before doing so. After all, we wouldn't want to see one of our beloved fans starve. Not that we're insulting your intelligence, we just felt the need to add a disclosure here. You know, just so we don't get into trouble for being a bad influence on young minds. Anywho, as you may already know, the human body can't last more than a few days without water. So just to add a bit of clarification, the cases we'll explore don't involve going without much needed H2O. We're talking solely about food. Because it's unethical to study starvation in a laboratory for obvious reasons, there's a current lack of scientific research about it. Thus, most studies revolving around the subject tend to examine occurrences of starvation in the real world, including instances of religious fasts and hunger strikes. Since these individuals are already choosing not to eat by choice, Choice, scientists can ethically look into and monitor the effects of these particular cases. We can also look into it by examining past instances of starvation. You're probably familiar with the historically famous Mahatma Gandhi, the man who lived in India during the late 1800s and early 1900s, inspired movements for civil rights and freedom across the world. He was a greatly inspirational figure, and some of his quotes live on today. Sayings like, the weak can never forgive, forgiveness is the attribute of the strong, where there is love, there is life, and many more. You may also know that he survived 21 days of complete starvation. How did he do it? What was his secret? That's what we endeavored to find out. Gandhi took on a total of about 17 fasts during India's freedom movement for independence from British rule. He often used hunger strikes as a tool to promote his philosophy of non-violence. It was his way of performing a peaceful protest. His first fast took place in 1913 from November 10th to the 16th. In 1914, his next fast expanded to 14 days. His third successful fast lasted three three days in 1918, and resulted in Amitabad mill owners rushing to the negotiation table to seal a settlement with the striking workers that Gandhi had led. He continued to take on fasts of different lengths in 1919, 1921, and 1922. Thus, in 1924, by the time of his famous 21-day-long fast, he'd already had a lot of practice with self-control and restraint from eating. He, of course, endured many more fasts after this, but 21 days was the longest his fast ever lasted. The Mahatma is considered the champion in the Department of Fasting and Hunger Striking. Many people have made attempts to follow the master and try it for themselves, 
They say it takes a ton of willpower and the temptation to eat can be highly, highly overwhelming. Starvation itself is not pleasant. You know that awful feeling you experience when you haven't eaten all day? Imagine that feeling, but way more intense. The severe deficiency in calorie intake combined with the most extreme conditions of malnutrition imaginable are enough to drive you mad. In this state of mind, it can be more than a little challenging to resist food. An almost animalistic mindset consumes you. You become ravenous, losing all sense of your humanity as your survival instincts take over. Suddenly, eating is no longer a choice, it's a must. People who have undergone starvation in extreme circumstances have reverted to just about anything to relieve their hunger. Consider the story of the 1972 plane crash in the Andes Mountains. A team of rugby players trapped in snow and freezing cold temperatures experienced extreme starvation to the point where they were forced to turn to cannibalism. The cold caused them to burn calories more quickly, and they were desperate. Thus, they ate the dead bodies of human casualties from the crash. We made an episode about this disaster not too long ago, so as a side note, you should check it out. There's another story from an episode of I Shouldn't Be Alive where two young teenage boys named Josh and Troy found themselves stranded in the Atlantic Ocean after taking a fishing boat out from the coast of South Carolina. They were lost at sea for six days, suffering from extreme starvation. This hunger caused one of the boys to snack on the poisonous jellyfish and even considered eating his own finger. The awful feeling of deprivation was enough to make both boys wish for death. One even attempted to drown himself to ease his suffering, but to no avail. This may seem like nothing though compared to the 76-day man, but that's discussed in another episode. There's a reason the temptation to eat is so powerful. After all, prolonged starvation can cause organ damage and death. In patients with anorexia nervosa, up to 20% die from organ failure or myocarditis cardio infarction. This tends to happen when the body weight falls between 60 to 80 pounds. Thus, the instinctual mechanism of action urging us to eat is meant and designed by nature to keep us alive. When you fast for a long time, you're basically fighting against your biological drive. Experts tend to recommend that you eat every 3 to 4 hours or so for optimal health, but starvation doesn't happen immediately, so skipping a meal now and then isn't a big deal. Your body is a well-oiled machine that doesn't want to go into starvation mode and will usually do whatever it takes to preserve energy to resist going into that physical state. Many people claim that they feel like they go into starvation mode after about a day of not eating, but this isn't the case. It doesn't happen as quickly as you might think. Registered dietitian Dr. Dubost from Pennsylvania told Self.com that it's actually very difficult to go into complete clinical starvation mode. There is also a difference between the popular culture perception of starvation mode and actually being physically starving. The threshold of time to enter the realm of starvation depends on the individual, but overall she says that it certainly takes longer than going a day without food. Once you're in that zone where you're really starving, there are said to be three phases that you go through before you die. Morbid, we know. Each phase is more unpleasant than the last. In the first phase, blood glucose levels are maintained through production of glucose from proteins, glycogens, and fat. There's only enough glycogen stored in a person's liver to last a few hours. After this, blood glucose levels are maintained from breaking down fats and proteins. The longer you go without eating, the more your body turns to resources within itself to keep going. The second phase of starvation lasts the longest of the three. During this time, your body fat is the main energy source. Your body drains itself of your fat to keep it sustained. You increasingly feel yourself getting skinnier, but not necessarily in a good or healthy way. It may be here where you feel like your body is screaming at you. I know you want to look good in that bikini, it might say, but please eat something, anything. Help us out here. Resisting its message is not easy, especially if you have access to food. The third phase of starvation occurs when fat reserves are used up and depleted. The body then starts taking from your muscles to feed it. Itself. When muscles are depleted, cell functions start to degenerate. Along with your weight loss, you may experience symptoms of apathy, withdrawal, listlessness, and increased susceptibility to disease. The last one happens because the impact of starvation weakens your immune system. Some people end up dying of illness due to starvation before actually dying from starvation itself. The diseases that starving people succumb to mainly include kwashiorkor and marasmus. Kwashiorkor affects those who are protein energy deficient and results in edema and enlarged fatty liver. This is also what gives starving children bellies, creating an illusion that they're well fed. Marasmas also happen due to extreme energy deficiency and results in infections that are caused by dangerously low levels of body weight. Death by starvation is incredibly slow and painful. When death finally does come, it's usually caused by cardiac arrhythmia. How long it takes to die often depends on your original BMI or body mass index before starvation. Generally, however, people typically die of starvation in about three weeks. Gandhi pushed the limits when he made it to 
21 days, though some people have actually managed to surpass the master. As cited in Scientific American, reports from well-documented studies have shown survivors of hunger strikes after 28, 36, 38, and even 40 days. But wait, some reports go beyond this. In 1981, a hunger strike performed by political prisoners against British presence in Northeast Ireland resulted in 10 people dying between periods of 46 and 73 days without food. Now, that's a stretch. Of course, this did lead to their demise, so they wouldn't have been able to exercise their bragging rights upon the strike's conclusion. One strategy that has been used to stave off hunger by those who have fasted for long periods of time include keeping notes to remind themselves of their motivation behind doing so. They ask themselves questions like, why am I still doing this, and what's the point of this again? They then try and answer the question so that the reasoning is fresh in their minds, pushing forward their motivation to continue not eating. Of course, this technique is not always perfect unless you have a very strong self-control like Gandhi. For most of us, we might cave in and decide that fasting isn't worth the effort anymore once we get a whiff of a juicy, delicious steak. Or a McDonald's hamburger with fries. Getting hungry? Yeah, we don't blame you. All this talk of hunger and not eating kinda makes you want to eat, doesn't it? In order to abstain from food for as long as great hunger strikers and avoid temptation, your reasoning behind a fast has to be a good one. In other words, you must be highly motivated to fast or you'll just wind up quitting easily and quickly. Some fast out of political motivation like Gandhi, while others may do it for religious purposes. Fasting for a greater cause seems to lead to the most successes. But if you're fasting for the sake of it, you may find that you soon give up, perhaps even before entering true starvation. This is because the pain of long-term hunger is too intense to endure without very strong, solid, motivational reasoning. Those of you smart enough to subscribe to our channel have probably already seen our episodes on the recent craze sweeping men all over the world, six-pack abs courtesy of cosmetic surgery. Our deep dive into this new craze amongst men revealed some pretty disturbing things, like for instance, the fact that men now opt for cosmetic surgery at a greater rate than women. Selfie culture seems to be taking a pretty big hit on the egos of men around the world. But what if you don't have thousands of dollars to spend on a quick surgical upgrade? Or what if you prefer to do things the more natural? Way. Stay tuned as we once more put your favorite and our least important staff writer through the ringer and challenge him to shape up or ship out as he does sit-ups for 90 days straight. Day 1 well, as far as insane challenges go, I guess I should count my lucky stars that this one is pretty mild. Doing sit-ups for 90 days is probably the tamest thing that infographics has put me through in a long time, maybe ever. And I guess I could use it. I like to stay in shape, but I have an unreasonable hatred of doing any kind of ab workout. It's exhausting on an emotional level. Like having to be the shoulder your friend cries on after the guy you warned her to never date inevitably breaks up with her. Only it's my abs doing the crying. If you followed these challenge episodes, you might remember that I also hate running, and for exactly the same reason, complete and utterly boring exercises. I know firsthand the benefits of constant sit-ups though, and used to rock a six-pack throughout my military career thanks to all the constant running and ab exercises. Seriously, the military loves making you do sit-ups. It's the weirdest thing in the world and almost on a fetish level. But you're always doing some variation of ab exercise from sit-ups to burpees. There were daily lunges, mountain climbers, burpees, side planks, supermans, bicycle crunches, Godzilla stomps, Russian twists, and butterfly kicks. So many insane ways to torture your abs that you you probably didn't realize I made one of those up. So I guess I'll be hopping in a time machine and going back in time to restart my old daily exercise routine. I stopped my normal exercising for a few weeks before this to get a better sense of how effective this would be for the sake of the challenge. So I'm looking forward to not feeling flabby and gross again, but I am not looking forward to the actual exercises. There's literally nothing more tedious than ab workouts, except maybe running. My routine will consist of the following in sets of three. 20 butterfly kicks, 20 traditional crunches, 20 Russian twists, 20 elbow to knee crunches, 20 burpees, 20 mountain climbers. Don't expect that I'll be able to fully complete three sets at first and it'll take a while, so if you're following at home and can only do one of the sets or part of one of the sets, don't sweat it. Just keep at it and note how you gradually get better and better. That kind of slow improvement is a great source of inspiration. I'll check in every 30 days, so I guess I'll see you guys in a month. Day 30. As predicted, I couldn't fulfill all three sets of each exercise at the start. In my regular life, I stayed pretty fit, but since I stopped exercising for a few weeks in preparation for this challenge, I definitely lost a lot of stamina and strength. I could barely crank out the first set on each exercise at first. 
And now at the end of the month I'm hitting the full 3 sets but definitely feel like I'm about to die at the end. As far as my actual abs, well, they're definitely noticeable when I press down on my stomach, but they're not super well defined. You can see a vague shape, but I'm not rocking a noticeable six pack. Sadly, that's going to take a lot more work. I guess I do feel better about myself overall though. It's nice to be exercising again and I kind of miss getting the blood pumping every morning. I've never been an exercise junkie, I just do it because I like the results and because I need to. But I don't get literal pleasure out of it the way my girlfriend does. But I think she's insane. Never fully trust anyone who says they honestly enjoy exercise. They're probably not really human. Probably some weird space alien in disguise, waiting for you to drop your guard so it can harvest your brains. See you guys in another 30 if my brain hasn't been harvested. Day 60 So, over the last 30 days, the workout routines have become a lot easier. To the point that doing the entire 3 sets of each exercise is not a problem. I'm still ending a bit winded, but I definitely feel that I could push it harder if I really wanted to. I know I talk a lot of trash about exercise, rightfully so, but honestly, getting to the point where you're doing things you could barely even start doing weeks ago does feel pretty good. There's few things in life with such clearly defined goals or moments of success as with exercise. Rarely in life do you physically see the goal you're striving towards, then realize the exact moment you've achieved it, and the moment where you're ready to push past it. As far as my body, well, you can definitely see ab muscles, and I guess I'm rocking what you'd call a four-pack. I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't know if I'll be able to get to the six-pack. My diet is a bit all over the place, and honestly, all the insane infographics challenges aren't helping in that regard. But more importantly, I just don't live the lifestyle I used to. Last time I had a clearly defined six-pack, it was basically my job to work out and keep in fighting shape, and my diet was pretty well defined thanks to the chow hall and MREs out in the field. Now I definitely do a lot less cardio, spend a lot less time in 100 plus degree temperatures, and eat a lot more terrible snacks. I feel like getting to an actual well-defined six-pack is an entire lifestyle choice, and I have no interest in that. I enjoy overeating occasionally and devouring an entire pan of cheesecake once in a blue moon. I have one more month left to go, but I'm not confident I'll be seeing a six-pack by the end of this. Day 90 90 day sit up challenge complete, and the journey was rough, then got okay, and then, I don't know, all the exercising just got to be part of my daily routine. I'm not going to pretend that exercise routines are easy, and I'll admit that if it wasn't literally my job to have committed every day to this routine, I would have taken plenty of cheat days. But as anyone following along at home knows, starting this journey is pretty damn difficult, especially when you're wheezing and gasping through the first few reps and your first set. In time though, it gets easier, and it feels pretty satisfying to see yourself pushing past your old limits. Eventually, if you stick with it long enough, it kind of becomes part of your nature. Surely, you'll take your cheat days, but I think the longer you stick with the routine, the harder it becomes to actually quit that routine, because it just starts to feel unnatural to not do it. After 90 days, my 60 day prediction held true. I'm definitely not rocking a six pack. But it's not because the muscles aren't there, the muscles are definitely there. But I just didn't commit to a complete diet change that would trim all the excess fat around my midsection and the belly. That's the thing about working out your abs. It's not just going to get rid of every ounce of belly fat unless you're carefully monitoring every bite of food you eat. It's called diet and exercise for a reason. I am, however, rocking a pretty nice four pack with some great definition, and, well, it kind of does a lot for your self esteem. Also, the girlfriend is practically in love with it, so that's a pretty big plus. In the end, though, getting those results is a personal choice, and if you can't find a reason to want this for yourself, not what other people think about it, sticking to a workout routine like this probably isn't going to be realistic. I really wish any of you following at home good luck, and I encourage you to stick with it. Getting in shape feels great and is great for your health. And take it from me, I know what it's like to want to quit, but don't. Keep with it and you'll see some pretty awesome results in time. Now, if you'll excuse me, I had to go buy a bunch of super douchey name brand workout clothes and take a series of really obnoxious Instagram pictures in front of a gym mirror. We all know that junk food is no good for us, and yet it remains the most popular type of food in the world. Once the bane of American waistlines who found themselves the butt of jokes around the world, now people all over the globe are experiencing their own obesity epidemic. Thanks to the proliferation of fast food in their countries, modern lifestyles have caught up with people everywhere, and long work days with short breaks typically make for quick meals, and nothing makes for a quicker meal that helps you hate a little less your soulless corporate 9-to-5 
like a Big Mac and fries. It's not just fast food though that's plaguing our waistlines and eroding our health, it's other junk food items which are made to be quickly consumed, effortlessly prepared, and taste great despite having poor or little nutritional content. These are things like any number of prepackaged cakes and pastries, ready-to-eat meals that only need microwaving and are loaded with sodium and low on nutrients, and processed meats made from the more questionable parts of the animal that are pre-sliced and ready to slap between two pieces of bread for a quick, convenient sandwich. Of course, that bread is a problem as well, because white bread is notoriously low on nutrients, and most manufacturers use a healthy amount of sugar to sweeten the bread, especially in the United States. Modern life can be stressful and the sad truth is that more and more people are spending less time preparing and actually eating meals than ever before. If you saw our previous episode on why you should eat slower, then you know that Americans lead the way in shortest time spent eating, averaging about 64 minutes of undistracted eating. That is time where eating is the primary activity, as opposed to eating and working. Even nations who have historically made mealtime a long extended affair such as Spain have seen the time spent preparing and eating meals drop precipitously over the decades. Again, modern life and its fast-paced lifestyle is to blame, and with time spent preparing and eating food going down, most people are opting for faster to make meals with lower nutritional value. In Britain though, one boy has paid dearly for his poor nutritional choices, or given how young he was when his trouble started, we should say that it was his parents' poor nutritional choices to blame for his condition. The parents claimed that this child was a very picky eater and would refuse any food that wasn't chips, french fries, plain white bread, and processed pork products. If you're familiar with the food pyramid, you'll quickly realize that this kid's food intake resembled less a pyramid and more a pillar, made up primarily of grains and meats. White bread though, as we mentioned, is notoriously nutritionally deficient versus say wheat bread and processed pork can have even less nutritional value than actual pork cuts, steaks and pork chops. It's made out of the leftover pieces of the animal after those cuts have been removed from the carcass. Also, things such as bologna typically have a great deal of sodium, nitrates and preservatives added, which when over ingested can wreak havoc on your health. French fries or chips also lose much in their nutritional content when they're fried, which is why health experts encourage people to bake their french fries instead, or eat baked chips rather than traditional fried potato chips. Sadly for this young boy, his parents did none of this, and due to his refusal to eat anything but these foods, they allowed him to continue eating his diet. At age 14, he went to the doctor. For our fellow American viewers who might be unfamiliar with the term due to the extreme costs of healthcare in our nation, a doctor is a person who heals you when you're sick, and in civilized countries it doesn't cost your life savings to do so. The child complained of extreme fatigue, though his parents failed to inform the doctor of the child's diet. A year later, he returned, only this time the child was complaining of hearing loss and vision issues. Now, doctors became concerned, and they immediately tested his body only to discover that he had extremely low vitamin B12 levels. Vitamin B12 is very important for the body. It helps do a great deal of things such as make your DNA and create red blood cells, and you must get it from animal-based foods. Apparently, the processed pork the kid was eating wasn't getting him enough vitamin B12, so the doctors put him on a series of B12 shots and gave the parents dietary advice. Sadly, the now teenager refused to follow his new diet, though he would start and try only to quit and go back to his regular diet. His vision continued to decline and by the time he was 17 years old he was fully blind. But then, he not only had an extreme vitamin B12 deficiency, but he was also low on copper, selenium, and vitamin D levels, along with a high zinc level and a reduced bone density, all because of his extremely poor diet. Even if he fixed his diet though, the boy would never see again. Despite his nutritional condition though, the teenager had a perfectly normal body mass index and had no outward signs of malnourishment. This is what makes non-fast food junk food so insidious and the damage it causes so difficult to spot. When you can look perfectly fine on the outside, while on the inside your body is slowly breaking down because of a lack of nutrients. The teenager's poor diet had led to nutritional optic neuropathy, a condition in which a lack of nutrients begins to affect the functions of the optic nerve. Typically though, this condition is seen in nations with starving populations or with individuals who are unable to absorb nutrients from the food they eat or have bowel issues. Due to the emergence of processed foods though, this condition is now appearing in people who simply eat extremely restricted diets. Sadly, had the teenager changed his eating habits, even just a year before his vision went completely, he would likely have made a full recovery. 
After so long of terrible nutrition, the optic nerve had degenerated enough to permanently blind him. His hearing had also been affected, and there's concern that the damage the brain had suffered may manifest with mental illness later in life. Parents of the teenager today report that he suffers from extreme depression due to his condition and has dropped out of college. His mother has had to quit her job to become a full-time caretaker, and though they try to improve his diet, he still refuses to eat better food. While the story is typically reported along with images of fast food, it's important to note that it was not fast food that harmed this teenager. In fact, fast food would have probably been healthier than what he was eating, aside from the weight gain issues. Instead, it was the extremely restricted nature of his diet, helped along with the fact that not only was he eating a very narrow list of foods, but those foods happened to be extremely processed, which further reduced their nutritional value. What this means is that, no, you yourself aren't going to go blind just from eating fast food or processed foods, and only run the risk if you too adopt such an aggressively limited diet. Researchers now believe, however, that the teenager in question actually suffered from a psychological condition known as Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or ARFID. A relatively newly diagnosed mental disorder, ARFID was only added to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 2013. Individuals affected are more than just picky eaters, and that term only serves to imply that the individual is poorly disciplined or spoiled by caretakers. Instead, people with ARFID actively avoid some or many food items because of severe anxiety that they suffer when eating them. Sometimes individuals may even experience extreme emotional discomfort related to the actual texture of the food. When attempting to eat one of these unwanted foods, individuals experience gagging and vomiting, which only reinforces the desire to stay away from these foods. Some individuals even experience intense fears of actually choking to death if they were to consume the foods they fear. Psychologically unable to eat anything outside of their extremely restricted diet, individuals with ARFID can quickly become malnourished. This British teenager, however, was a rather extreme case, and most people have only a small or moderate list of foods they cannot eat. Psychologists still don't understand what triggers conditions like ARFID, but much like anorexia or other eating disorders, this condition can be improved with professional help. Sadly for the British child in this story, his condition was missed, likely by an understandable lack of knowledge of the condition, and his fate was sealed. Still, with their child's health steadily decreasing, it begs the question why his parents didn't seek out other professional help, when traditional medical help wasn't resolving the issue. In the end, we should carefully balance how much junk food we eat, but unless you're eating such an extremely limited diet, you're not in danger of going blind anytime soon. Hello Infographics fans! What's more, we're concerned about your health. Obesity rates are finally starting to come down across America, but while the Battle of the Bulge may have started here in the USA, it's spread around the world. Today, modern nations are all battling obesity, as our overprivileged first world lifestyles make life easy and convenient. All that convenience comes at a cost, though. And while the world may have laughed and snickered at the US's weight problems, now it's them eating a double serving of humble pie, as populations all over Earth are having to add a few extra holes to their belts. But what can you do to help keep your weight down? And what if you want to start losing weight? Once more, we're tasking your favorite and our least important guinea pig with finding out in this special challenge episode of the Infographics Show. Lose 10 pounds in one month. Day 1 It feels so bizarre to say this, but thank God for a normal challenge for once. I mean, by comparison, losing 10 pounds in one month is a cakewalk, or a healthy alternative to a cakewalk, rather. At least compared to wearing makeup in public, telling absolutely zero lies for a week, or walking on your hands for 30 days. And no, that last one isn't some secret challenge episode the infographic show is waiting to release. I'm just making a point about the level of insanity the producers over at the Infographic Central have been cooking up for the last year. Not gonna lie, this challenge even feels a little necessary. As most of you know by now, I run some of these challenges concurrently because the infographic show sadly realized that there just isn't enough months in a year to torture me with. Typically, the challenges don't overlap as far as their effects, but let's just say the last few challenges have had me vegging out a lot and, well, the pounds have crept up on me. That probably doesn't make any sense for our younger YouTube audience that routinely sits on the couch playing Fortnite and devouring sodas and bags of chips all day long without gaining a pound, but just wait until you approach your late 20s and early 30s. Oh man, you have such a rude awakening coming up. Enjoy your blissful ignorance of calories while you can. So even though this challenge seems pretty easy, it's gonna hit me hard because if there's one thing I hate, it's dieting. 
I don't eat terrible food all too often, but when I get a craving, I want it, and I want it now. And for the next 30 days, I'm not allowed to touch anything that will add a single extra calorie to my diet. I decided that I would try four different meal plans for the next month, one each week, and record my weight loss and maybe get an idea of which worked best. For the first week, I'm going to go largely on a liquid diet, which means a lot of juices and smoothies and as little solid food as possible. That's going to make for some fun poops," he said very ironically. For the second week, I'm going to go all vegetable, and right now I'm going to tell you that I'm considering this my hell week. It's not that I don't like vegetables, it's that they are C-SPAN level boring. For the third week, I'm going to try something a little less drastic and instead stick with fish, vegetables, and fruits, limiting the bread and pasta that I eat, and I'm a big fan of both of the latter. Finally, for the fourth week, I'm just going to let the girlfriend cook her heart out and eat whatever she makes. I can tell this challenge really excited her, and as I was making up my plans, she looked about ready to burst, practically begging me to let her take over one of the weeks. I'll be recording my weight loss, how I feel, and my thoughts about what I'm eating. Spoiler alert, I'm probably going to hate all of it. End of week 1 This was the juice and smoothie week, and when I weighed myself tonight I found that I lost 2.9 pounds. I've read that weight loss and dieting is more of a state of mind than a physical act, and individuals who stick to a plan where they lose 1-2 to two pounds a week tend to continue successfully dieting. I guess that's because whatever plan they're on, it's one that they can live with as opposed to something really drastic and flat out unbearable. In that regard, I guess I'm pulling slightly ahead of the curve. I mostly drank juices and smoothies, but I did have a few regular meals in between, because I'm not an animal. On date night I had a pretty big dinner, and halfway through the week I made pasta for both me and the girlfriend, so that definitely pushed the calories. But I guess all of that juice and smoothie drinking paid off and counteracted the weight gain. As far as doing this long term, unless you're a big juice person, I'm not sure that it's totally realistic. I tend to get very bored with juices, and when I make my own smoothies, I always get yelled at by the girlfriend for adding way too much sugar. She says I'm making milkshakes, not smoothies, but I've just never been a huge fruit person myself and I need something extra to help it along. Physically, I feel fine. Although I'm not going to lie, liquid diets really leave me craving solid food. The first few days, it was all I could do to keep myself from rushing to the nearest burger joint and eating myself into cardiac arrest. One week down though, see you guys in 7 days. End of week 2 Several special operations military training programs have a period of time referred to as Hell Week. This is typically close to the end of your training, and it's when you're pushed to your mental and physical limits, and then right over them and far beyond anything you thought you were capable of, or you just get washed out, one of the two. This last week was my Hell Week. Vegetables are my Everest. So for the entire week I ate nothing but vegetables, just to see what the difference would be between the different diets. I included fruits in there as well because I'm not a total maniac, but for the most part lunch and dinner were vegetarian. It's not that vegetables are terrible tasting, they really aren't, it's just that they're, well, vegetables. I mean, I don't know, there's something deep in my programming that says vegetables don't compute. I don't need to eat meat all the time, but my brain refuses to believe that vegetables alone are enough to satisfy hunger. I can literally fill my stomach until it's bursting, and my brain will absolutely not acknowledge the fact that hunger has been fully sated. But if I even eat just a moderate helping of pasta or something non-vegetable, then my brain is like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, that's enough to fill us up. I lost 3.5 pounds this week, but the entire week I felt physically weak and emaciated. Vegetables are amazingly nutritious and full of vitamins and energy and all that crap, but as far as my body is concerned, I might as well have been eating cardboard. Even my performance during my regular workouts was far worse than before, and I'm starting to think it was all mental. It's like a car with a governor on it that keeps it from going faster than 55. Green beans are my governor and keep my physical energy in the pits, or maybe it's just that by feeding it nothing but vegetables every day my body simply found no reason to continue living and wanted to throw in the towel. I don't know, but I do know that going strict vegetarian is impossible for me. Two weeks down, two to go. End of week 3 I guess this week was what I would call a pescatarian or someone who adds fish and seafood to a normal vegetarian diet. Of the three diets so far, this was the most palatable and I actually feel pretty decent after losing 2.1 pounds. I've never been a huge fan of seafood, but fish fillets is pretty close to real meat and I think it helped to make the entire experience more livable. Then there's the fact that I was allowed to eat shrimp and clams, and while I'm not a big fan of seafood overall, I love shrimp and clams. On date night me and the girlfriend went to eat sushi since it was one of the few options that 
are allowed in the rules, and everything else was just basically fried fish or shrimp or whatever. I happen to like sushi, which is weird because I know it's starting to sound dubious when I keep saying that I don't like seafood, but really I don't. Yet sushi is different. Maybe I just don't like cooked seafood, which would make sense considering my brain's very weird positions on different foodstuffs. Tuna steak? No thank you. Gross and fishy. Tuna roll? Yes please. Straight into my tummy. Anyways, this week wasn't so bad, but it was by no means enjoyable. I miss desserts. And there's literally nothing that makes you want a nice big piece of cake less than after dinner fish burps. But I guess maybe that's the point. End of week 4. Hallelujah! The end is here. Four weeks of insane diets finally done. And with this week's weight loss of 1.8 pounds, I've officially hit the goal of 10.3 pounds lost. So this was the week that I let the girlfriend take over my meal planning. And I really hate to admit it, but she made this last week the most bearable of all. There were no gimmicks this week, instead I basically just ate what she already eats on a daily basis. The focus was not on sticking to specific foodstuffs or not eating groups of things, but rather on portion control. We ate pretty much the same things we would normally eat with the exception of breakfast. Typically she eats bowls of fruit and I make myself a bowl of sugary cereal or scrambled eggs, but this week she had me eating fruit one day and then a moderate portion of what I wanted the next. For lunch and dinner we stayed away from red meat and ate a lot of chicken and pork, but the difference is we focused on smaller, more appropriately sized portions. I even got desserts! Within reason of course, and all of them were low fat or sugar free. Which is fine because after weeks of hell, even sugar free ice cream tastes delicious to me. My mood was pretty good the whole week. Probably better than it's been all month to be honest, because I wasn't forced on some gimmicky diet that was making me miserable. Instead I got to eat things I legitimately enjoy, even if the portions weren't quite as satisfying as I wish they would have been. I think that's the hardest part about portion control, having the self control to limit yourself to only eat what you should instead of stuffing your face until you burst. My weight loss this week was the least of all weeks, but I feel like it was the healthiest and it was definitely the most satisfying. Realistically speaking, I could see myself doing this successfully for weeks at a time, but eating nothing but fish or vegetables or juices is all but impossible. It might not have gotten the biggest results, but it was definitely the diet most likely to stick, and it left me feeling the best afterwards. For anyone following at home, I highly recommend portion control and of course exercise. You're just not going to lose much weight on dieting alone, and I wouldn't have hit my goals without it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to physically dive into a man-sized chocolate lava cake to celebrate the loss of 10 pounds I'm about to immediately put back on. I was in agony. Absolute, total agony. Around me were hundreds if not thousands of people, all of us intent on being some of the first people to take a ride on Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure at Universal's Islands of Adventure theme park. I had seen the sneak preview video and it looked amazing, like no other ride I'd ever seen. There was no way I was going to drop out of that queue, but the pain, oh my god the pain. I felt as if I was holding on to a rising balloon, and if I just held on a little longer I could make it, but if my grip failed me I would fall and die. Well that's just a metaphor, but in reality I really was on the verge of death. Let me explain. First of all, you should know that I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, not just a fan of the movies but the books and everything else related to the magical teen and his band of extraordinary buddies. You're probably thinking that I'm just a kid, but you'd be wrong. I was a kid when the first movies came out, but as some guys on the mean streets sometimes say, once an addict, always an addict. When I heard about the new ride in Orlando, I got in touch with another guy I knew from the Harry Potter fan club Facebook page and we both agreed we'd try to get in on the inaugural ride. The reason I picked him is because we both live in Florida. I'm in Tampa and he's in Jacksonville. We wouldn't have to travel too far, so the deal was made. The plan was to get a hotel close to the theme park and the next day wake up well before dawn and start queuing before the crowds came. As you guys all know, you can have the best intentions in the evening and when you get up in the morning, you don't have the same amount of enthusiasm. We were sharing a room and that meant when that alarm clock went off at 3 am, we weren't in the best of moods. Maybe those few beers the evening before had been a bad idea. Fortunately, the hotel had a 24 hour cafe, so I sank two double espressos followed by a bottle of water, followed by a mocha frappuccino to go. My friend wasn't into coffee, he said it gave him anxiety, but I can tell you this, soon after I downed those espressos, I was good to go. 
Since I knew we'd be standing in line for maybe a couple of hours, we bought some stuff from the convenience store and put the food, water, and soft drinks in our backpacks. What was surprising was the fact that when we got to the park around 5 a.m., there was already a stream of people lined up at the entrance to the park, all of them there for Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure. No kidding, we even met a guy who'd come all the way from England. The dude was dressed in a wizard's cape and written on it were the words potty for potter. He had to explain to me that potty can mean crazy in the UK. The guy was kinda condescending about having to explain that to me, but I paid it no mind. The guy was potty. There was no doubt about that, flying over the Atlantic for a theme park ride? He told me he'd read in the media that the experience was one of a kind, and the park had spent $300 million on it. He said some of his countrymen traveled the world to watch their stupid football teams lose, so what he was doing wasn't at all that crazy. You mean soccer? I asked genuinely. What did I know? No, he said, shaking his head in disdain. I mean football. Jeez, I thought, I'm going to have to spend the next few hours next to this guy, and I've already upset him. After about an hour, we saw more and more people join the queue. It was hard to say how many because it wrapped around the corner. In front of us, I'd guess there were about three to 400 people. The time was now about 7 a.m., so there was only a couple of hours to wait before the park opened. But the thing was, I needed to pee. I'd only had those small espressos and I'd barely touched my mocha frappuccino, but I still felt those first pangs of pee pain. You know, the part where you're not quite sure that if you just hit the release button for a second if something would come out. At 9am, we were allowed inside the park and to my surprise, no one tried to cut in line. Every single person was directed toward the ride, with some of us now inside the theme park, and from what I could see, a lot of people still in line on the outside. That made me feel quite proud that we made the decision to wake up so early. The sun was now out, and I was in a bit of a predicament. I still needed that pee. Well, I needed it more, but I was also thirsty. Those beers the night before really had been a bad idea. I decided I'd just take a sip of some Coca-Cola rather than glug down the water. I'd later find out that that decision was a bad one because sweet soft drinks, like the coffees I drank, are what you'd call diuretics. What are they, you might wonder? Well, the answer is they promote something called diuresis. Okay, so you're still in the dark about this? The simple answer is they make you pee. Pee more than, say, water. Caffeine is the king of diuretics and I just had coffee and coke. I was really holding that pee in at around the 10 a.m. mark, about five hours into our queuing. There were some helpful distractions, such as videos playing with some amusing words from Hagrid, or pictures of the ride itself, and the pretty amazing forbidden forest that had been created. But still, I was now in pretty serious pain. At around the six hour point, I was standing cross-legged and slightly bent over. This seemed to ease the pain as if I were squeezing the tubes where the urine traveled to meet its final destination. What I would later find out after a bit of research was that at that point, I was in danger of weakening my bladder muscles, something which could harm my bladder for the rest of my life. In hindsight, that was the least of my worries. Sure, we were getting close to the ride, I hoped, and I just stood there looking like a man who was slightly demented or had recently been in an accident. My buddy had done the right thing and had just been taking small sips of the water. But to be honest, in his excitement, I really don't think he was that concerned about my predicament. I'd also later find out that the parts of my body that were helping me keep in the pee, now probably a tsunami waiting to happen, are called the urethral cylindrical sphincters. These are great when you tighten them for a short while, such as when you don't want a puddle of pee beneath you on a busy bus, but they're brakes, not doors. They can be worn out. At the 7 hour mark, I couldn't overstate how much agony I was in. I knew we were getting close to the ride, so I held on for dear life. That British guy heard me telling my buddy that I thought I was about to pee myself. My friend laughed, but I can tell you, it wasn't funny to me. My buddy said that if it was that bad, just go find a bathroom and he'd hold my spot in the queue, and you won't believe what happened next. That British guy overheard this and said in no uncertain terms that if I left the queue then I'd have to start from the back. He said he also needed a pee, but in Britain he said there's a thing called queuing etiquette. I think that this guy thought he was special just because Harry Potter is British. That or he was just a xenophobic snob. I can recall his exact words. He said the reason we have queuing etiquette is because if we didn't then there'd be chaos. Queuing chaos doesn't work, he said, and then he went about a time in the past he had difficulty buying a train ticket in India and how he'd almost gotten into a fight at a buffet when hordes of hungry Chinese people fought over the shrimp. He said he wasn't picking on me, only that if order broke down, then order would cease to exist. Formal and orderly queuing, he said, in a patronizing way, is the mark of a civilized man. What a total jerk. 
He told me that if I left the line, he'd make a complaint and say I had cut in line. What I really couldn't believe is that the other people in the line didn't get my back, so I guess one less man in the line was good for them, so they just kept quiet. The words that went through my head were, the milk of human kindness, and then I wished I hadn't thought about milk, gallons of it pouring over pristine porcelain mountains. At that moment, my urethral sphincters almost called it quits. I'll fill you in later, but I'll tell you that it already caused myself some damage. I was at about the 9 hour point, then we were very close to the ride entrance. I'd almost made it, but the problem now was the excitement I felt almost made me lose concentration and loosen those muscles and let all the urine flood out. I had to concentrate. Keep the door locked, I kept saying to myself. Everyone was laughing and joking, taking selfies and looking in awe at the ride we were about to go on, and I was undoubtedly the only man in that queue who did not have a smile on his face. If anything, I grimaced, a kind of agonized grimace, like someone who just won the lottery and then been told they only have a week to live. We finally got in the castle, but to be honest, I was in no mood for taking photos. I was hardly even aware at this point if I was actually holding a pee in. It was like I'd gone into survival mode. It felt like my urine had become a hardened prisoner, my entire body was now some kind of detainment unit. That ride itself consisted of Hagrid's motorcycle with a sidecar next to it. I told my buddy that in the interests of me holding the pee, it might be best if I took the bike and he took the sidecar. It was all about control, you see, I needed to feel in control. That British guy was right behind me on the other bike, something he'd regret to this day. At something like 50 miles an hour, we drove past Fluffy the Three-Headed Dog and other such things as Cornish Pixies and a Centaur. I didn't really care. I just wanted the experience to be over as quickly as possible. This was turning out to be one of the most painful and pointless days of my life, and there would be consequences to come. I thought I had it under control, even on the biggest descents and through the sharp bends, but then there was a surprise drop and the heavens burst. The tsunami came. My bladder roared as its doors were kicked down by a violent torrent of urine. My pecker must have been flailing around like an out of control fire hose. Hours of backed up urine gushing from its spout like a great yellow geyser. The pee was everywhere, and it stunk. It was old pee, neglected pee. And when it ejected from me, it spread far and wide. I looked behind me and saw that British guy wincing, looking utterly disgusted. His eyes were glaring into mine. Was I embarrassed, you might ask? No, is the answer. I was relieved, incredibly relieved and almost ecstatic that my British foe had tasted the vapors of an agony he had been an accomplice in creating. I know guys, maybe I shouldn't have felt so overjoyed that someone had to experience great wafts of urine vapor in their face, but you know what? I paid for it. I soon got my karma. When I finally got back to Tampa after a pretty awkward farewell with my Harry Potter fanboy buddy, I felt a stinging pain every time I went to the bathroom to pee. After seeing a doctor, I was told I had a urinary tract infection. That could be cured, he said, and he told me he couldn't believe I'd done a 10-hour urine hole. If there are records, he said, I might have broken some. The bad news, though, was that he said the damage done could be irreversible. He told me that long-term bladder stretching could make it hard for me to pee in the future, and one day if I kept doing this kind of thing, I might have to put a catheter into my member and draw the urine out. On the other hand, all that stress on my bladder could lead to incontinence, so holding in even normal pees would be impossible. I had some blood checks and my kidneys were functioning normally, but he said, when you do anything as crazy as I did, kidney damage can occur, as can the appearance of kidney stones. Just don't make a habit of enduring those marathons, he said. A few minutes is fine, but holding it for hours isn't good for you at all. The one thing he said that really scared me is when he told me that the bladder can actually burst when you hold in a pee as long as I did. He said it was very rare, but it had happened. When it does happen, you can actually die. He told me not to worry though, because the cases he'd heard about all happened to people who already had compromised bladders. He said, like what happened to me, before the bladder bursts, people will just pee themselves. He said cases of healthy bladders just bursting are so rare that he doubted that it could have happened to me. But in the few cases it has happened, urine leaked into the abdomen, and when people didn't get straight to the emergency room, they died. The punchline to this story is that I could have actually told one of the attendants at the park that I needed the bathroom and gotten the green light to go, and he would have made sure I got right back into the queue despite what that British guy might have said about that.
The average person will sleep about 8 hours a day, so that's a third of your life catching Z's. If you live to the average age in most developed nations, that will mean you'll spend somewhere close to 10,000 days in bed asleep. That's more time spent sleeping than you'll do any other activity, and of course, we're not counting breathing or thinking or seeing. With this in mind, you'll have to give great respect to this thing we all call sleep. Sleep is our great relief, and countless studies tell us that if we don't get enough of it or get too much of it, there will be negative consequences regarding our physical and mental health. You best make sure you're sleeping right, given how much of it you do, and today we'll tell you how to sleep well. Before we get into the advice, we'll tell you that research has shown that quite a lot of people do actually sleep in the wrong position. You might feel like it's the best way to drift off, but some positions can cause people harm. Some of the consequences of bad sleep positions might be you wake up with pains, sometimes in the neck, sometimes in the back, shoulders, or knees. You might just feel stiff in the morning, a little bit too rigid, but there's more than that. Some people snore because they're in the wrong position, and while we all let out a few nighttime grunts now and again, Snoring can become a problem not only for your health but for your sleeping partner's mental health. Your friends might balk at sharing a hotel room with you too, and if you're especially loud, you might annoy people in the same house but not even in the same room. Because you're sleeping all wrong, you might wake up feeling really tired as if you haven't slept much at all. While some people wake up with headaches and according to some experts this might be a pillow problem. Other problems related to bad sleeping positions can be waking up with heartburn or inflammation in certain parts of the body. So without further ado, let's see how to sleep well. First of all, you might not know if you're not sleeping right because you have some of the symptoms we mentioned. You might just feel groggy every morning, or your sleep tracker might be telling you that there is a problem. Not everyone is the same, but we'll tell you how some positions can cause certain problems. Sleeping on your stomach can be a good thing and a bad thing. One of the problems with this is the fact that with a high pillow, sleeping on your stomach can cause neck pain. You're basically forcing your neck into a very difficult position every night, and this is why you might wake up with pain there quite often. The obvious solution to this, if you're a habitual stomach sleeper, is to get a lower pillow or totally get rid of your pillow. Yes, some doctors say sleeping on your stomach is best done without a pillow. You could at least give it a try. But there's more. Sleeping this way can make it harder to breathe because it's not exactly the most comfortable breathing position. Eileen Rosen, an associate professor of clinical medicine for the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia, said that there is a solution. Try not to sleep like a plank, for one thing, so bend the knee and the elbow. After that, to help more with position, put a small pillow underneath that armpit and hip. You can also take some pressure off your back by putting a pillow under your stomach. Try it. Play around with using pillows, not just for your head, but to support other parts of your body. You might just find you get a much better night's sleep. As for those head pillows, well, if you are a stomach sleeper or a back sleeper, don't have them too high. You only want enough height to keep your spine straight. Have you ever seen those images of Sleeping Beauty sleeping on her back with her head at a steep incline? Well, Miss Beauty no doubt woke up with a terrible neck crick. You don't need to go too high. So what about those folks that feel so comfortable sleeping in the fetal position? Oh, don't we all miss those cozy days in the womb of our mothers? It's actually the most popular position, and it's a good fit for most people. But there are problems too. It can cause breathing problems which might lead to a bad night's sleep. One thing you can try if you like to sleep in this position is putting a pillow under one of your legs and holding on to it, as if you're hugging the pillow. In fact, in many places around Asia, people sleep like this all the time, except they hang on to something that looks a bit like a sausage. Sometimes they're called sausage pillows. They're not only used for people who like to sleep in the fetal position, but also to support other parts of the body. Buy one, stick it next to you, and we guarantee you'll soon be clinging onto it as a form of support and comfort. Many of the experts tell us that the fetal position with some support can be the best way to sleep. A lot of sleepers, and it's well documented, have lower back pain because of the way they sleep. Again, one thing you can do to fix this is get some kind of support. To prevent lower back pain, you might try sleeping with that support under your knees, in between your thighs, and again, if you sleep on your stomach, underneath you. So what if you like sleeping on your stomach but not really in the fetal position? The best thing about this is that it can reduce all that snoring you do. It's also a lot better for digestion and heartburn than on your back. One study we found though said if you want to reduce heartburn and acid reflux, you should try and switch sides a lot, at least when you're trying to get to sleep. Just about everyone anyway says don't eat a big meal and go to sleep, especially a real fatty meal. It's not great for your weight, so try and give some space between eating and sleeping. 
If you're a side sleeper, there might be problems such as shoulder stiffness and even jaw tightness. Again, another pillow under your body can help this. Side sleepers like fetal sleepers can really benefit from having something to hold on to. Not many people actually sleep on their back, but it does have quite a few benefits including helping with knee pain and hip pain. It's more of a laying in bed and thinking position than a sleeping position, and many of us retreat to the stomach or side at some point. The important thing here is to get the pillow height right, since too low or too high will give you neck pain. It's also the position that a lot of people do their snoring in. If you are a serial snorer, then try to tell yourself to sleep on your side or in the fetal position. There are other tricks too, including sleeping with a tennis ball in the back pocket of whatever clothes you sleep in. In the end, there is no magic sleeping position to suit all, but if you're experiencing bad sleep or pains, you can just follow some of the advice we've given to you today. As one doctor from John Hopkins Medicine said about positions, we could argue that some are better than others, but there are caveats. She means what we just said. If you snore too much, don't go for the back. And if you have pains, try a different pillow or using support. And if you have heartburn, switch to your other side. The left is better, she said. If you often wake up with your face looking rather mangled, then try not to sleep on your stomach too much. Apparently, this can cause wrinkles in the long run. Not much of this matters, of course, if you have a mattress that's been around longer than you. If it's out of shape with a kind of dip in the middle, it's going to give you problems. It's hard to say which mattress is perfect for you because some sleepers suit hard mattresses more and some suit soft ones more. If it's cheap and super soft, so you virtually sink into it, it will likely give you some back problems. Soft can be good, but not too soft. It's the same with super hard. If the mattress doesn't allow any sinking at all, it might lead to stiff shoulders and stiff hips in the morning. You don't want to be sleeping on a virtual floor. So you let things get out of control. The pounds seemed to pile on and it was as if you weren't noticing the changes in your body. Then one day you looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I have really let myself go. Don't worry, that happens to most of us at some point in our life. As we age, love handles appear, the belly grows, there seems to be flaps of flab growing under your arms, and in general, you just don't feel as fit, strong, or flexible as you used to. The other day, you bent down to pick up a fallen coin and pulled a muscle, and you decided it was time to get fit again. Today we're going to tell you how not only to look good and feel good, but how to get shredded. It's not as hard as you think. We're going to start by telling you a true story of a man that in his prime was a competitive weightlifter, only for an injury to sideline him for quite a long time. His couch-bound days transformed his body and what was once a chiseled physique became an ordinary body replete with bulging belly and a set of love handles a small person could hang off of. Don't worry if you've never been in great shape before like him, because his road back to being ripped is one anyone can follow, regardless of what body shape you have or have had. Although thanks to muscle memory, it'll be a lot easier for him to get back to being shredded than it would if you're not used to exercising. It's all basic stuff and you don't need to be an expert to do it, nor spend a ton of money. What you will have to do is make a plan and stick to it. We're asking you to commit maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day and make some other small changes. The transformation will be noticeable in a short period of time and the payoff will change your life. So first of all, you need to lose some weight. You know this because bending down to tie your shoes is an effort and well, the mirror doesn't lie, nor does your doctor. You might be strong, but it might not be noticeable on the outside. You want to look strong and you also want flexibility back. It's a cliche these days, but it's true. To lose weight, you can't just rely on exercise alone. Many studies have shown that Americans in general are exercising more, but many people are still overweight. Diet is important and that's an understatement. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a report in 2018, and this was their conclusion. Americans are exercising more, but the obesity rate is growing. The first thing you can do might sound extreme, but it's not that extreme. This is what the former weightlifter did. Go into your kitchen and look at what's in the cupboards and the refrigerator. All those highly processed foods, the stuff with empty calories, you'll throw away or at the very least don't buy them anymore. The chips, the cookies, the stuff you keep snacking on that couldn't be said to be a whole food. These things must go. You want to be eating wholesome foods, raw foods such as chicken, lean beef, vegetables for salads, whole oats, fish, some fruit, nuts, you get the picture. You don't want to be eating those sugary cereals, frozen pizzas, etc. There are a plethora of websites out there that can tell you what healthy foods are, but for now, look at what you have that's highly processed and get rid of it. We're not saying all processed food is bad, but just try and concentrate on eating what we might call nutritious food and certainly cut back on the sugar. 
We might also add that for many people around the world, intermittent fasting has helped them lose weight. This might mean just having a meal in the evening and then waiting 16 to 24 hours for the next meal. That includes not having sugar in your drinks. This is really not as hard as you think, and some people have even said it's the lazy person's diet because essentially it requires less effort than eating or shopping for food. It might also save you some money. We're not saying that you have to go vegan when you eat or follow a diet that makes it almost impossible for you to eat because of the time it takes you to buy all the healthy foods. It's okay to eat a burger, have some rice, but just go easy on the carbs and get rid of all the food that doesn't have a good calorie versus nutrients balance. This is already enough to make you lose weight, especially with some fasting now and again. One thing we should say about intermittent fasting though is if you have health issues, please check with your doctor before you do it. Now comes the training. If you want to get ripped, you'll need this part, of course, and it will take some effort. Saying that, you'd be surprised just how fit you can get from your own living room. We also suggest that when you can walk, walk. Get in as many steps as possible and do things like take the stairs instead of the elevator if you're not going too high up. If you work sitting down, try and get up every so often, then walk and stretch if possible. We suggest you try to work out six times a week and have a rest day. This can be any day, but sometimes your body will tell you when it's time to take a day off. Out of these six days, you can either have one or two cardio days. We understand that for some people who have packed on the pounds, running for one hour or cycling up a mountain is a big ask. Don't hurt yourself, so just do as much as you can. You can find some experts that will tell you to try to push yourself to 80%. If running is too much, in the gym you have two great machines to start on. These are the elliptical trainer and the rowing machine. Neither machine should stress your joints too much. You can change the settings, but again, why not tire yourself to about 80% of what you can do? Each time you use the machine, add 5 minutes to your workout. If you can row for 1 hour and halfway up the resistance levels, you're doing well. In fact, you really don't need any more than this for a good cardio workout. If you find 10 minutes is hard at rowing, the elliptical machine, or jogging, then just build up until you can reach an hour. Let's also remember that a lot of people will tell you half an hour is good to maintain weight and be healthy, but you're trying to lose weight and get ripped. Now let's say you don't have the time or the money to go to the gym. Well, there are lots of things you can do from your home. You might say a plank a day keeps the belly away, but it could be an exaggeration. But planking at least once or twice a day for as long as you can is very good for you and your shape. For ab exercises, you really don't need the gym at all. There are endless home exercise routines you can find online, some of which are free and can be found on YouTube. We warn you though, if you're a beginner, then don't feel bad if you feel pooped before the video even gets going. Some are much more high intensity than others. If you search for Spartan workout videos, you'll find some of these to be hard to follow. We don't mean understand, of course, we mean follow the guy or girl in the video as they take you through the exercises. The good thing is these videos can be seen for free, and they will get you into shape quickly especially now that you've changed your diet. You might also invest in two things. These are kettlebells and dumbbells. The dumbbell we have known for a long time, and we know what to do with these. Whether to do bicep curls, work the triceps, back, chest, or various parts of the shoulders. But kettlebells, these things are amazing. And fortunately, there are hundreds of possibly thousands of exercises and videos online showing you how these things can make you very strong. All the exercises can be done at home. Follow these exercises and you will burn fat, build muscle, and increase fitness. What about your chest? Well, again, just search to find out how to build your chest up from the comfort of your own home and you'll find scores of articles and videos. The same goes for back exercises. There are many exercises you can do that require no weights. And then with those kettlebells and dumbbells, there are many more exercises you can do. As with the chest, there are just too many exercises you can do for your back at home for us to mention them all. Google will take you there and you'll find pictures and videos that will help you get it right. We suggest if you follow the high intensity workout videos, then you follow their 5 or 6 day plan. If you don't watch those videos and create your own sessions, then just do different body parts each day. Remember that you don't have to prove anything to yourself and go all out. Go at 80% and make sure you have perfect form before you add more reps or increase the weight. In all, try and do 1 hour of these exercises a day. But if that's not possible, start with what you feel comfortable with and just build up to 1 hour. With these strength exercises covering all parts of your body, as well as one or two days of cardio, plus the change in your diet, we assure you that in six months you will look like a different person. And try to see it this way. Most of us spend one hour a day just wasting time. That time wasted could transform you. 
give you loads of confidence and, the best thing, stave off sickness and make you live longer. As for the man we talked about at the start of the show, he lost 50 pounds in 6 months and he looked completely transformed. His advice is envision what you will look like in a few months and don't let that vision out of your mind. It's not always easy making the first move, but you'll find that once you start, you won't want to stop. You'll even feel bad for missing a day. Don't worry, everyone gets sidetracked at times, but when you do get going, you'll not only feel better physically, but you'll have more mental clarity. Exercise is as good for the mind as it is for the body. You'll notice a big difference in your overall wellness and ask yourself this, is one hour a day of making yourself a bit tired worth the effort if you look better and feel better and are much healthier in general? Do you love strange unexpected stories that defy belief but are completely true? Then you'll love the new show I Am fascinating tales told from the perspective of those who lived them. Find out what it was like to be a plague doctor during an outbreak of the Black Death, or the captain of the Titanic as it sank into the sea. Each episode, you'll jump inside the mind of a new person and get a first-person view on incredible events like no other. New episodes every week. Be one of the first to subscribe now and tell us who you want to see brought to life in I Am. Remember the last time you had a burger? Juicy, beefy, meaty, maybe flame grilled and a little smoky, or maybe it was a turkey or salmon burger. Remember the delicious flavor exploding on your tongue? Can you trust that the meat pad you ate was actually what it purported to be though? During a series of tests done on ground meat items in the winter of 2012, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland or FSAI discovered the presence of equine DNA in several alleged beef products. In 27 beef burger products tested, just over one-third or 37% were positive for horse DNA, and 85% were positive for pig DNA. Thankfully, in all but one product, the equine presence was at a very low level, about 0.3% horse DNA. However, the frozen beef patty product, Everyday Value Beef Burgers, sold at Tesco Markets and manufactured by Silvercrest Foods, a subsidiary of huge multinational food processor ABP Food Group, was found to have 29.1% equine DNA, as well as pork DNA. FSAI informed the Irish Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine of the results of their tests, and they also notified their British counterpart, the United Kingdom's Food Standards Agency. On January 15, 2013, five retailers who sold the horse-tainted beef products, Tesco, Dunn Stores, Aldi, Little, and Iceland, were informed of the test results. These five supermarkets and a few other grocery stores ended up removing 10 million burger products from shelves. On January 16, amid widespread media attention and public outrage, four subsidiaries of ABP were accused of supplying adulterated meat. They were Silvercrest in County Monaghan, Dale Pack in North Yorkshire, Fresh Link in Glass ABP Nina in County Tipperary, Ireland, and Dairycrest, Rosington. Supermarket Tesco immediately dropped Silvercrest as a frozen meat supplier but continued to use ABP as a provider of fresh meat. Over the next several days, the scandal continued to grow as the news set off a chain reaction of meat investigations and testing by several groups and governments. Burger King, for whom Silvercrest was a regular supplier, switched beef patty providers just as a precaution. Other major grocery retailers such as Sainsbury's, Asda, and the Co-op also removed some frozen meat products as a precaution, but later the products were found not to contain horse. However, Asda did its own testing and found 5% fresh horse meat in its personal brand beef bolognese sauce. The sauce was supplied by Greencore, an Irish food company. Greencore said it purchased the meat in their sauce from ABP's Nina plant. Both Greencore and ABP ran tests and couldn't find horse meat in the pasta sauce. However, Asda stood by its test results. ABP especially received a lot of criticism from the media and public. They blamed rogue meat suppliers and claimed their company had never knowingly sold horse meat. On February 7th, Findus, a food company, announced that in a sample of 18 beef lasagna products that it tested, 11 items contained between 60% and 100% horse meat. It also found that there was 60 to 100% horse meat in ground beef items. They traced the source of the tainted meat back to Comagel, a third party French frozen ready meal producer. The adulterated products had been made by Comagel's subsidiary Tavola at a factory in Capel in Luxembourg. On February 14th, the French government suspended the license of French meat processing company A La Tabla de Spanguero, claiming that the company knowingly imported horse meat from Romania, relabeled it and sold it as beef. 
meat had been backtraced from France through Cyprus and the Netherlands to Romanian abattoirs. Over a six-month period, Spangaro had shipped and sold 750 tons of adulterated meat. One of the companies they sold to was Comagel. However, Comagel wasn't blameless either. Investigators felt that due to inconsistencies in the paperwork and the smell and look of the meat when defrosted, Comagel staff should have realized that the meat was not beef. A number of other companies were also found to have a wide range of issues with their products. Nestle found 1% horse DNA in its Butoni beef ravioli and beef tortellini made by German subcontractor HK Schipka and sold in Italy and Spain. One of the largest private catering businesses in the UK, Sodexo, which supplies 2,300 institutions, including schools, prisons, and branches of the armed forces, had to withdraw frozen beef products after finding horse meat in the sample. In an odd twist upon testing, Jaidekoka 30% beef meat pie, which was sold in Iceland, was found to not contain any meat at all. Pertinent to finding horse and beef products was the worry that the horse meat could contain traces of the veterinary drug phenylbutazone, a common painkiller for horses. Even with above-board production of horse meat, there are regulations that horses treated with the drug cannot legally be used for human consumption. Further testing of horse-tainted beef samples was done by multiple authorities, and thankfully, the presence of phenylbutazone was not found in the majority of product. For samples where the drug was found, the level of contamination was only 1.9 mg per kilogram, a minuscule amount. That's less than one-eighth of a teaspoon per two pounds. The UK's chief medical officer Sally Davies stated that the level of contamination posed very little risk to human health, adding that you'd have to eat around 500 to 600 100% horse meat burgers to receive the daily human therapeutic dose of phenylbutazone. When all was said and done, over $4 million in meat products had been destroyed. Authorities were not able to determine how many citizens in the EU unwittingly ate horse meat. The public was rightfully outraged, reputations were damaged, and the sale of frozen hamburgers fell by 43%. Sales of frozen ready meats containing beef fell by 13%. Executives at various companies pointed fingers and blamed other companies. As a result of the scandal, various countries in the EU began more rigorous testing of meat products and doing more factory inspections. Countries also increased penalties and punishments for those caught selling adulterated meat. Initially, only a few lower to mid-level people in the meat industry were arrested and charged with fraud in the months after the horse meat scandal broke. However, since then a number of arrests have happened, often in joint international stings involving people knowingly selling mislabeled horse meat or selling horse meat considered unfit for human consumption. Notably, in July of 2017, the Guardia Civil, Spain's national police, in coordination with Europol, the European police agency, arrested 65 people involved in an organized ring believed to be selling horse meat unfit for human consumption throughout Europe. The arrested were charged with animal abuse, document forgery, perverting the course of justice, crimes against public health, money laundering, and being part of a criminal organization. The EU continues to struggle with creating legislation and implementation of systems that fully monitor monitor and trace adulterated and contaminated food products. During the horse meat scandal in Europe, some Americans were worried that the horse meat tainted beef was being sold in the US too. The US Department of Agriculture, or USDA, was quick to reassure the public, saying that adulterated beef was unlikely in the US food supply. Because not only do no domestic suppliers slaughter horses, but the agency has strict labeling and inspection standards for imported meat. However, individual species testing for meat imported into the US is typically only performed when there's a reason to question a shipment. Ultimately, the U.S. has done limited research in regard to species testing in meat products. A 2015 study by researchers at Chapman University's food science program did find that in 48 samples of fresh and frozen ground meat products of various animals, 10 of the samples were mislabeled. Of those, 9 products were found to contain more species than the packaged label indicated. The 10th sample label was completely inaccurate. Traces of horse meat were found in 2 of the samples. The authors of the study thought that the findings of multiple species suggested the possibility of cross-contamination at the processing facility, that equipment wasn't properly cleaned between the processing of products, so the meat mixed. Also, the study indicates the possibility of lower-cost species being intentionally mixed in with higher-cost species for economic gain. Unfortunately, since the Chapman study, there hasn't been further testing for various species and meat products in the US. Individual companies and retailers do private testing, but unless a widespread issue occurs, those tests will probably never come to light. 
Now, if you live in America or in a country that doesn't eat horse meat, you might be a little nauseated by now. We bear no judgment as to whether horses should be eaten or are just for riding. While the idea of eating horse generally grosses out Britons and Americans, once upon a time our countries did eat horse. In fact, during World War II when beef was rationed, many Americans turned to horse meat as a cheap and tasty substitute. Currently, in many other countries such as Iceland, Slovenia, Belgium, Germany, Poland, and China, horse is simply another meat choice. Furthermore, horse is actually considered a delicacy in Japan, where it can be served as sashimi. But all this is besides the point. What the scandal and various studies have revealed is that multinational firms are controlling huge parts of the consumer food chain. Shady decisions made by contractors of contractors, sometimes in different countries, affect what's on your plate. Food fraud is on the rise. A 2014 report estimated that food fraud costs the global food industry 30 to 40 billion dollars US every year. As well as adulterated products, food fraud is also mislabeling products and even obscuring where products come from. Can you as a consumer trust what your food packaging says? In general, misleading or mislabeling packaging seems to be a much bigger problem than potential adulterated mystery meat in America. But why does it matter if your burger which was labeled product of the USA came from Texas or Latin America? A variety of reasons. For example, some consumers have made a decision to only purchase beef that was raised in a place where the rainforest wasn't destroyed to create pasture land for cattle. For others, minimizing the carbon footprint of their food supply chain is important and they'd rather eat meat that was shipped from only a few states away as opposed to flown in from thousands of miles away. Others want their meat slaughtered in a certain way for ethical or religious reasons. Also, there's the simple but very important notion that consumers should be able to make purchasing decisions based on accurate labeling. Current gaps in American law allow cattle and pigs to be slaughtered overseas and imported to the US where they're cut up. Since they're processed in the US, this allows companies to slap a product of the USA sticker on them. How is that possible, you're asking? In 2015, the U.S. Congress voted to repeal laws that allowed the USDA to enforce country of origin labeling or cool requirements for beef and pork products. The World Trade Organization WTO, had ruled that Canada and Mexico could begin imposing more than $1 billion on tariffs of the U.S. products in retaliation for having to label meat products as produced in their countries. They felt that some shoppers would eschew products labeled as having been imported from Canada or Mexico. Worried about tariff issues, Congress repealed cool and companies have been using the repeal to their advantage ever since. However, in July of 2019, the current Congress showed some interest in reinstating cool. Beef is not the only protein that's mislabeled in the US. Seafood is frequently substituted and mislabeled. In March of 2019, a marine conservation nonprofit, Oceana, released a new report on the state of seafood fraud in the US. They found that 20% of the 449 fish for sale they tested were incorrectly labeled. To highlight how widespread the issue was, the fish samples were purchased from different retailers in 24 different states and the District of Columbia. Among other findings, the report discussed that the most commonly mislabeled fish were sea bass and snapper. Mislabeling often occurs in the case of cheaper, less desirable imported fish which are sold as local catch and when farm-raised fish were marketed as wild caught. A previous Oceana report found that 59% of tuna sold in the grocery stores and restaurants is not actual tuna, and 87% of snapper isn't snapper. In August of 2019, Philip R. Carawan, the former owner of supplier Captain Neal's Seafood, pled guilty to having his company falsely label and sell over 179,872 pounds of foreign crab meat from South America and Asia as product of the USA, making over $4 million in the process. It isn't only meats that are targets of food fraud. According to the U.S. Pharmacopoeial Convention, a nonprofit which helps create standards for drugs, dietary supplements, and food ingredients, the top three adulterated or mislabeled foods are milk, olive oil, and honey. These are often cut with starches, less expensive oils, and corn syrup, respectively. Frankly, the issues we've been discussing are just the tip of the iceberg. By now, you might be thinking that you should raise and slaughter your own beef, catch your own seafood, keep bees, and plant olive trees. For many people, that lifestyle simply isn't possible. So what can you do to ensure that what you're eating is actually what you think you're eating? Educate yourself. 
Some industries have created committees or task forces committed to ensuring the quality and safety of their products. They sometimes put out reports, testing items, and touting top quality products for the industry. The olive oil industry has actually created seals that reputable companies can include on their labels, a sign that the product is of good quality. If possible, purchase local. Get to know the sellers at your local farmer's market or co-op. You're less likely to purchase mislabeled imported food there. Also, you can hold your elected officials responsible. Don't be afraid to send an email or a letter to authorities detailing your concerns. Often, the USDA has a comment period where they actively seek public feedback when considering new regulations. Ultimately, you can also vote with your wallet. When possible, don't support companies or retailers who have been revealed to be involved in mislabeling, promoting, or selling fraudulent products. It's been said that there's nothing more noble than humanity does than spaceflight. And it's us, we're the ones that said that just right now. Sure, humans do a lot of great things, but we do a ton of completely awful things too. The challenge of space travel though forces us to pool together the best of humanity, because space wants nothing more than to kill you in the most horrible ways possible. After visiting the moon though, the rest of the world decided that sitting parked in low earth orbit was good enough for humanity, and that doesn't mean that our most recent and greatest accomplishment in space, the International Space Station, isn't any less of a wonder, weighing in at 925,335 pounds or 419,725 kilograms for nations who didn't land on the moon. The ISS is 73 meters long and 109 meters wide. Aside from the Earth, the ISS is the single largest human-inhabited structure in our entire universe. In fact, it's the largest thing built by humans to ever exist outside of the planet. But as awesome an accomplishment as the ISS is, the simple fact is that life in space is tough. Turns out, humans are pretty badly adapted by evolution for living outside the Earth's protective atmosphere. Who knew? So if your dream is to become an astronaut, get ready to learn why life on the ISS absolutely sucks. Working out all the time. Humans evolved on Earth, but in the last 60 or so years we decided that Earth wasn't good enough anymore and just like the Jeffersons, we moved on up to a deluxe apartment in the sky, sort of. Turns out though that trying to live somewhere you didn't evolve to habitate comes with some pretty serious side effects. On Earth, we have the gentle but constant pull of gravity keeping us firmly in place and occasionally reminding us that flying through the sky in giant metal tubes is blasphemy. All that gravity has a pretty profound effect on the evolution of our physiology, and very quickly after starting their respective space programs, both the USSR and United States discovered that fact. Gravity's incessant pull keeps our bones strong as our body constantly reinforces them with calcium so that we don't collapse into a heap whenever we try to stand up. It also has a myriad of unknown effects on the way that blood circulates and even how organs operate, and we're still learning about these effects as NASA prepares for long-term human habitation of the moon, and eventually Mars. If you don't like exercising, then space is not for you. Because if you want to live in space, you're going to have to do a whole lot of exercising. Each day, astronauts exercise for at least two and a half hours using specialized equipment meant to help them combat the effect of zero gravity on their bodies. Without exercise, astronauts start losing both muscle and bone mass because the body has nothing to fight against. But it's not just becoming a smaller, shrimpier version of yourself that you have to worry about, because low gravity makes it harder for blood to get around in your body, making you at risk of extreme fatigue and passing out. Fatigue, loss of bone mass and muscles, and the threat of constantly fainting, the ISS definitely sounds like a place it sucks to live in. But if you have a sensitive nose, you won't like our next reason why living in the ISS sucks. Recycled farts. Take in a deep breath. Odds are you probably smell whatever's immediately around you. But even if that scent is bad, you know it's just not going to linger for long. If your brother starts getting a bad case of the bottom end grumps, you know all you have to do is open a window and the stink is nothing more than a memory. Now imagine that you can't open a window or that you never get fresh air. That's the ISS. One of the chief concerns of spaceflight is ensuring that the astronauts have enough breathable oxygen. Because after extensive scientific research, man's greatest minds deduced that breathing is pretty important for keeping people alive. But getting things into space is extremely expensive, so expensive that getting a few months worth of oxygen up to the ISS is simply a non-starter without bankrupting a small nation. That's why the ISS uses state-of-the-art oxygen recycling systems, which can reuse oxygen over and over again. It does this by first splitting the water brought up in resupply missions into oxygen and hydrogen. That hydrogen is recombined back into water using black magic, or science we guess, which in turn means you can create more oxygen. 
but that also means that you're going to be re-breathing the same fart for a very long time. Like astronaut Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space and said in an interview once, smells linger on the ISS, especially because without gravity, scents can more freely spread. But bad smells isn't all, because aboard the ISS, everything, not just air, has to be recycled, and that means water, as in the water you pee out. As another astronaut put it, yesterday's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. You'll be drinking so much of your own pee in space that it'll make Bear Grylls proud. Showers can and will kill you. Who doesn't love a nice hot shower? Well, on the ISS, taking a shower is not just practically impossible, but also potentially deadly, as American astronauts found out back in the Skylab days. During the early days of spaceflight, when crews would be in space for a few days, they had no chance to clean themselves, and it was said that the smell of returning astronauts and cosmonauts was so strong that it was like running into a wall for the crews that recovered them. When the US put its first space station into orbit, Skylab, one of the things that NASA determined would be important was crew comfort, and so it included a sort of shower. The Skylab shower consisted of a special curtain you could pull up around you which cocooned you into a small tube-like structure, then you turned on the water which shot down on you from above, above of course being an extremely relative term in space. You would then lather up and wipe yourself clean with floating water before vacuuming it all up. The problem, though, is that in zero gravity, water behaves more like jello than, well, water, and tends to clump together. Also, it has nowhere to fall to, so it just sort of floats around, heading wherever it last had momentum toward. This proved to be particularly dangerous as large clumps of water could easily be inhaled or float directly over an astronaut's mouth or nose. Also, there was the ever-present threat of water getting loose and floating everywhere. And on a space station jam-packed with delicate electronic equipment, the last thing you want is an electrical short. Skylab shower risks were so bad that when it came time for the ISS, NASA said astronauts would just have to resort to wiping down manually. While many astronauts will attest that you can get decently clean in space wiping yourself down with wet towels, the truth is that you can only get so clean when you can't run soap and water over you. Radiation everywhere on Earth, radiation is only a concern when ordering sushi fished off the coast of Fukushima or when one's trying to get the superpowers of a spider. Space, however, is pretty much lousy with radiation, and at such extreme altitudes, astronauts on the ISS don't enjoy as many of the benefits of Earth's magnetic field to protect them as we do. You'll pretty much notice immediately that you're suddenly smack dab in the middle of a cosmic radioactive shooting gallery the first time you close your eyes. With your eyes closed, you'll start seeing flashes of light, like some sort of disco resurgence, but it's not terrible 70s music making a comeback, it's the universe trying to murder you to death. Stars, black holes, and all kinds of other celestial phenomena do all sorts of sciencey stuff all the time. A lot of that nerdy sciencey stuff creates radiation. That radiation then travels across the universe until it finds your soft, squishy body full of DNA to destroy. The awesome light show you're enjoying with your eyes closed is highly charged particles smacking into your eyeballs and tricking your brain into believing it's receiving a signal telling your eyes that they see light. And the flashes are just from the radiation hitting your eyes. Imagine how much more blasts the rest of your body and you can't even see. But of course, the ISS is well shielded against radiation, but nobody knows just how well protected you would be in the ISS from a particularly energetic release of radiation by the sun or a nearby star. Even with low levels of radiation though, the fact is your DNA is still being cooked over weeks, months, or even years in space. What does all that radiation do to your body? Well, we haven't observed enough individuals for long enough who've endured long-term spaceflight to really know yet. Most scientists agree that astronauts have a higher chance for cancer, and maybe like a 0.01% chance of superpowers, but just how big a chance for the big C is unknown. What is for sure, though, is that if the ISS's shielding ever failed or was damaged somehow, and a strong blast of radiation washed over it, you'd be cooked faster than popcorn on high. Speaking of cooking, though, if going to space makes you hungry, enjoy your food while you still can here on Earth, because in space, the food is terrible. You can't really cook in space, at least not in the conventional sense. We're pretty sure most of our fans already knew that. Lugging up the supplies for making a home-cooked meal in space would be pretty wasteful use of very limited space on cargo flights. Plus, how would you even keep pancakes from just floating off a pan? Instead, all space food comes in plastic packaging. And while you might have an oven to heat it up, it's all pre-cooked. NASA does try to provide variety in order to keep morale up, but the simple fact is that pre-cooked meals taste universally terrible, and even more so when the actual food you serve up on the ISS has to be something that won't make a giant mess. 
Macaroni and spaghetti with meatballs is a staple item, but forget about a nice stew or a lentil soup. Condiments are available, though salt and pepper come in liquid form, and we have no idea what that even means nor do we want to find out. The reasoning is solid though, salt and pepper in their normal forms would simply float away and just get everywhere. It's a good thing that the condiments are available because you simply won't taste much of your food unless it's lathered in pounds of condiments. If you've ever seen footage of astronauts in the ISS, no doubt you've noticed they all look a bit puffy in the face. That's because without gravity all the fluids in your head go on a free-for-all, floating around wherever they like. In turn, this makes astronauts congested, and if you've ever had a really bad cold then you know that unless you're eating wasabi by the spoonful, you really can't taste much. Terrible food, radiation that'll kill you, recycled farts, and showers that'll drown you. Life on the ISS definitely sucks, which only makes us admire more the men and women who are even there right now pushing the limits of the final frontier. Ask any woman who's had children and she'll probably tell you that pregnancy sucks. Morning sickness, stretch marks, sore ankles, and the absolute nightmare that is childbirth which many women have described as the most excruciatingly painful experience in their life. Normally, if a man said to a pregnant woman, I know how you feel, she would probably rightfully laugh in his face. Unless of course that man was William Bennett, a 79-year-old man from Sheerness, Kent, over in the UK. By 1981, he'd experienced his 30th pregnancy. This is the story of the man who kept getting pregnant and the extremely strange condition that caused it. We know what you're probably thinking, 30 pregnancies would be utterly insane for a woman let alone a man. How is this possible? These are all fair questions. Maybe your mind immediately jumped to Thomas Beatty, the transgender man who reached tabloid stardom in the Guinness Book of World Record fame for being the first public example of a pregnant man. Or for a more modern example, Hayden Cross, another transgender man from the UK who became the first legal male in the UK to give birth to a child in 2017. But what makes William Bennett's case feel particularly strange is the fact that he's not transgender, and even if he was, at age 79 he'd be decades beyond menopause. William Bennett's strange pregnancies had everything to do with his four daughters. Every time one of his daughters got pregnant, William would begin to exhibit the symptoms of pregnancy. Specifically, his belly would begin to swell up and remain in a swollen state until the pregnancy ended. This came as a shock to Mr. Bennett because this hadn't occurred at all when his wife was pregnant with any of his four daughters. He didn't, however, miss any of his 30 grandchildren. The Bennett family was apparently breeding like rabbits and William was feeling all of it directly. And before you say that all of this sounds like an urban legend, these strange symptoms were corroborated by William Bennett's general practitioner, recorded only as Dr. Fitzgerald. According to her tests, during one particularly severe incident, where three of his daughters were pregnant at the same time, Bennett's abdomen bloated out by an incredible 30 inches. If you're having trouble picturing that, that's actually half an inch bigger than your standard NBA-approved basketball. He'd need to invest in pregnancy pants and some very loose-fitting shirts to live comfortably during that ordeal. While no doctor was ever able to diagnose the concrete medical reason behind what was physically causing William Bennett's stomach to swell, there was actually some medical precedent for the condition he was experiencing. You may have heard the term phantom pregnancy or sympathetic pregnancy thrown around before, or the more arcane medical term Quavad syndrome. While this typically occurs in more expectant fathers than grandfathers-to-be, and cases are rarely as severe and dramatic, cases of phantom pregnancy are actually a lot more common than you'd think. In 2007, researchers at St. George University in London carried out a study into 282 expectant fathers who were experiencing phantom pregnancies. These men had experiences that ran the gamut of pregnancy woes. Swollen stomachs, like William Bennett, cramps, sickness, mood swings, pregnancy cravings, depression, insomnia, fatigue, fainting, and back pain. In some studies, doctors have noticed subtle physical changes in the biological makeup of the men experiencing these phantom pregnancies. There were slight hormonal shifts in prolactin, testosterone, estradiol, and cortisol. Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology Dr. Amos Gruneberg also noted that hormone changes tend to kick in after the first trimester and persist until birth. While these dry scientific descriptions might make it seem like this experience isn't too bad, to actually suffer through this bizarre condition is kind of a nightmare. Here are some of the ways the men in the study described their extremely strange conditions firsthand. One man said, I was constantly hungry all the time and had an unstoppable craving for chicken kormas and papadoms. Even in the early hours of the morning I would get up and prepare myself one. 
It was strange to say the least. And another one said, it seemed like my pain was worse. Her contractions were fairly strong, but she couldn't push. And as that was happening, my stomach pain was building up and up and getting worse and worse. Even though medical science had advanced significantly by 2007, scientists still couldn't find a concrete physical reason for these strange psychosomatic symptoms. There were also other commonalities. Symptoms would more often manifest early on in the pregnancy, often persist throughout the nine-month course, then dissipate after birth. Some doctors had theories about why this weird anomaly was popping up. One of the researchers, Dr. Arthur Brennan, said, These men were so attuned to their partners, they started to develop the same symptoms. Some people may perceive this as men trying to get in on the act, but far from attention-seeking, these symptoms are involuntary. Often the men haven't got a clue about what's happening to them. Brennan went on to declare, Doctors don't recognize Quavad syndrome. There's no medical diagnosis, yet this research proves that Quavad syndrome really exists. The results speak for themselves. Luckily, for people suffering from phantom pregnancies, they don't have to deal with any of pregnancy's unpleasant after effects. There have been no reports of men suffering postnatal depression. This, however, doesn't mean that the experience doesn't have some scary psychological side effects. Some men have reported having extremely distressing dreams and night terrors. One man describing a dream where he was lying in bed, the ceiling caving in above him, and millions of spiders crawling through the hole. Some have also reported disrupted sleeping patterns and even sleepwalking. Though, to be fair, if you were suddenly mysteriously pregnant, you probably wouldn't sleep well either. Why William Bennett had such a severe case of phantom pregnancy if he actually did have the symptoms, or if he ever even existed at all, we may never truly know. Whether it was down to a particular cocktail of hormones or a really empathetic disposition is a detail lost to history. But one thing is for sure, if you're a man whose wife or girlfriend is trying for a baby, maybe invest in two pairs of pregnancy pants just in case. Let's set the scene for your upcoming death. You're lying in bed, surrounded by family and friends. The lights are dimmed and your breathing is shallow. The people around you know it's almost time. You might seem unconscious to them, but in your mind all kinds of things are happening. Images of childhood come back to you. You're selling lemonade on the street outside your house. Then you're a teenager holding hands with the person who was your first love. You fast forward to adulthood and you're saying I do with the woman who was your first wife. A decade later, you're doing the same routine with your second wife. And then the scene fades to black, except there's a light ahead of you. Death is calling, and you walk forward, or is that how things happen? Or is there nothing during those final few minutes? Having your life flash before your eyes might seem a little too romantic for some. Maybe we don't get this last picture show right before death, and all we're left with is the lights going out. That's it, game over. No great trip through history with the Grim Reaper acting as the tour guide. In 2017, a neurologist named Dr. Cameron Shaw shed some light on those final 30 seconds before the final bell goes. He explained that before we die, right before, there will be blood loss to the brain, unless there's some massive injury and it lights out immediately. Before we die, we're going to fade out because of this lack of blood to the brain. When that happens, the vision narrows, so right before death, we may well experience something like going down a tunnel. That's perhaps why a lot of people who have died and come back have talked about tunnels. He added, though, that he doesn't believe in out-of-body experiences, only that loss of consciousness might feel like a narrowing of vision and then blackout. The doctor was asked what happens during those final 30 seconds and he replied that we slowly shut down, and the bits that shut down first are the parts of the brain that make us us. That's our sense of self, perhaps our humor. After that, the parts of the brain that shut down are the bits where we store memories. You're then still alive for a few seconds, but the doctor said you're pretty much in a vegetative state. This is how he explained it in an interview. For all intents and purposes, you could say they're dead because they don't have a consciousness or an awareness of their surroundings. But if these basal structures are intact, they'll still breathe and have a pulse. Still, people report seeing all kinds of things near death. Some researchers at Hadassah University in Jerusalem, after interviewing people who had near-death experiences, concluded that indeed some people had their lives flash before their eyes. They said that the life might not flash in any type of sequence, though, only lots of muddled memories that have flashed through the brain of the almost dead. One woman explained it like this, it all happened at once, or some experiences within my near-death experience were going on at the same time as others, though my human mind separated them into different events. Then we might look at the story of Dr. Rajiv Parti, 
a man who is the former chief of anesthesiology at the Bakersfield Heart Hospital in California. He was having an operation for his cancer when things went horribly wrong. He didn't die, but was close. He since written about what he saw during those seconds he was leaving the planet. He wrote, My father led me down the tunnel toward the light, and we looked at it together, its intensity oddly soothing. I moved forward and then began to walk rapidly in its direction, pulled by a powerful sense of love emanating from its radiance. My father let go of my hand, and I kept moving forward. That doesn't sound too bad at all. And then he said he entered another realm where he met archangels of the Bible. He said they took him to a place where he saw this. The sweet smell of grass and roses made me almost delirious with pleasure. A crystal clear stream of water cut through the meadow, and the air off the distant mountains was blowing gently. He said he felt pure love in this new land, and he was ready to leave the old land of his former life. That sounds like a massive hallucination, perhaps close to something someone might see on the substance DMT. Psychology Today wrote a story about near-death experiences, but like the doctor we introduced at the start of the show, the writer said a lack of oxygen to the brain might only feel like a tunnel and then you're gone. Tripping in a land of angels and green pastures should not happen. So why do so many people say they see such things? If the brain is dying, we shouldn't really be seeing majestic things, it should be the opposite. This is where DMT comes in. Full name, NN dimethyltryptamine. This stuff is sometimes called the spirit molecule, and if you watch Joe Rogan, you'll know he and a lot of other people, while erring on the side of caution, believe this stuff can open a doorway to another kind of reality. DMT is everywhere, in plants and in animals. It's illegal in most countries when it's made into a powerful drug, but in other countries it's taken as part of ceremonies. If you listen to what people say about a thick soup called ayahuasca is like, it's nothing short of unbelievable. DMT is part of that drink and sends people into an another reality. If you know anything about DMT, you'll know a lot of people say we humans can produce it all on our own, with some people saying it's responsible for these great dreams we have. Others say as we die we might produce a lot of it. Indeed, scientists at the University of Michigan said the mammal brain can make its own DMT. In a now famous documentary called DMT the Spirit Molecule, a clinical psychiatrist called Rick Strassman said upon death DMT can be secreted by the brain's pineal gland, and we might have a mystical experience. This is all quite controversial, but it might explain angels, roses, and eternal love. A bunch of researchers at the Psychedelic Research Group at Imperial College London wanted to get to grips with such mystical experiences near death. They began a study, and people on that study all had near-death experiences. In the study, they took DMT and then were asked to compare their trip to their near dying. It turned out there were similarities. One of the researchers concluded, our findings show a striking similarity between the types of experiences people are having when they take DMT and people who have reported a near-death experience. Scientists are still trying to figure this out, and while some are sure rats create DMT in their pineal gland, others are not so sure humans can do it. More research needs to be done. Another scientist who has studied near-death experiences did say, though, that the experience is often transformative. People who have taken ayahuasca or plain DMT have said the same thing. This is what he wrote about people who have had near-death experiences, and it really does sound like someone who's just come back from Peru following a five-day ayahuasca marathon. He wrote about near-death experiences. A person's values and attitude toward life are completely transformed. People often become less materialistic and more altruistic, less self-oriented and more compassionate. They often feel a new sense of purpose, and their relationships become more authentic and intimate. They report becoming more sensitive to beauty and more appreciative of everyday things. He went on to say that a lot of people do have have those mystical experiences before death, and indeed, they might be a massive hallucination. But he said DMT experiences are not nearly as transformative as near-death trips. There are a lot of skeptics out there, but some people believe that consciousness is a part of the universe at large, and not something just in us. Perhaps when we die, we feel this connection to everything else. Perhaps DMT helps us to realize this connection. The jury is still out, but it's not something we think should be laughed at. So we might trip out before death, and if we survive, survive, it might change us forever. We found plenty of stories online in which people said they had a wonderful experience at near death. They were so very willing to go, they said, it was peaceful. Some described it as beautiful, so if you believe them, then we all have something to look forward to. Science is still in the dark about this, and while a dying brain should not give us these amazing experiences time and again, people have said that that's exactly what happened to them. We went to a Reddit thread where people talked about what happened to them during their near-death experiences. Here are a few of the replies. To me, it felt a bit like slipping into a dream. Everything in the dream feels and looks bright and colorful. It feels like a last hours, but when I came back, I'd only been gone for less than three minutes. 
The subject of the dream or anything about it, I didn't remember. I knew none of it made sense, but it felt peaceful, almost uplifting. There's no excitement or struggle or really any awareness of what's going on. You just sort of kind of fade and slip away. Everything is kind of insubstantial, like it's there but not. You sort of know something's not quite right, but somehow that's not important. It felt as though I was sinking into a deep dark pool of water. Everything around me was black and the world we live in kept getting smaller and smaller. It was like I was sinking slowly into a world of unknown. Sound began to act as though it was farther and farther away. In this strange way, I felt at peace. While some scientists say our dying brains should be slowly becoming more inactive, one scientist said this to the BBC. A lot of people thought that the brain after clinical death was inactive or hypoactive, with less activity than the waking state, and we show that that is definitely not the case. If anything, it's much more active during the dying process than ever with the waking state. But more research has shown that some people don't have those illuminating experiences, and during their near-death experience, all they got was pretty much nothing. Another doctor who was interviewed by Live Science said, some people who have come back from the dead said they saw people in the room. He said they'll describe watching doctors and nurses working and they'll describe having an awareness of full conversations, of visual things that were going on that would otherwise not be known to them. He said we still don't know exactly what goes on with consciousness as we die, but there is enough evidence out there to suggest more than fading to black might take place. So to conclude about what happens in the mind before we die, it seems a lot of people do enter another kind of realm and some feel at peace. It seems some people do see the past, memories of their life, while others don't think about much at all. We can only ask those who have come close, of course, because the dead tend to be quite tight-lipped. By the way, we thought we'd add something to the end of the show because it's relevant and it's just so fascinating. We might also make a show about this in the future. Did you know that doctors of late have started putting people into suspended animation? Like keeping them suspended in death and then bringing them back? This recently happened at the Maryland School of Medicine in the US, and the doctors called it emergency preservation resuscitation. What they did is cool the person down by replacing some of their blood with an ice-cold salt solution. This prevents oxygen from getting into the brain, but the person can be brought back to life. The reason the doctors would do this is so they can perform a medical procedure on someone. Let's say that a person has been shot or stabbed and they go into cardiac arrest. They've lost lots of blood and will die in about 5 minutes, so that means surgeons have to work very fast. But with the suspended animation technique, they might get 2 hours to work on the person. They're technically quite dead, but are brought back. We'd love to know if anything was going on in the patient's mind, but unfortunately this is all new, and their thoughts weren't in the articles that we read about this. The US Food and Drug Administration has just given this the green light, and those surgeons don't even need to get a person's consent before they do it. You all know what it's like to be called heartless, but thankfully it's only been said to you in the figurative sense, when you did something like take the last M&M from the packet. But can you imagine what it would be like to be literally heartless, like to have an empty space where your heart used to be? You might be thinking right now that this is not possible, but you'd be wrong to assume that. We know that because these words were spoken by a US teen who lost her heart for a few months. It was like I was a fake person, like I didn't really exist, I was just there. Yeah. She didn't much enjoy her time without her vital organ. We'll get to her miraculous story soon, but first let's give you a rundown on how science has tried to fix the problem of living without a heart. We hate to state the obvious, but we should let you all know that some hearts work better than others. That's not always because of age or lifestyle or even disease. Some people are just born with what are called congenital heart defects. Sometimes a bad heart needs to be replaced, so we have a thing called a heart transplantation. The problem is there just aren't enough hearts to go around. We're going to point out the obvious here again and tell you that donors aren't alive and well and decide to give up their hearts. What happens is someone who is declared brain dead or on a ventilator and had before this downfall agreed to donate his or her heart, they'll have their heart removed and it can go to someone who needs it. The problem is there are thousands of folks just in the US on the waiting list. There are a lot of dodgy trickers in the world, as the British might put it, and not enough donors. If a lucky person is lucky enough to get a new heart, that transplanted heart would have to have been a good match. Usually the donated heart has to be transplanted within about 4-6 to six hours, and there's always a chance the living person's body might reject the heart. That's pretty selfish of the body, but hey, it's picky about who it lives with. We won't go into too many details because this is not necessarily a heart transplant story. What happened to the teen in the US is way more incredible than merely having a heart transplant. But first, you need to know why. 
You see, because so many people need transplants and there's not enough hearts to go around, science has been trying to make what are called artificial hearts. As you can guess, that's not an easy thing to do. In the 1960s, the National Institute of Health created an artificial heart program. During that decade, partial mechanical hearts were put into young cows, and for a while the calves were fine, but after a few months they were dead. That didn't bode well for the heart-needy humans, of course. In 1969, a man in the US went 64 hours with a pneumatic-powered artificial heart inside of him, but then 32 hours later he was dead. This replacing hearts business was very tricky indeed. It was in 1981 that a dentist from Seattle got the green light from the FDA to have a full artificial heart implanted. He survived 112 days, but all the time he was fastened to a huge compressor that pumped air into him. This was not a good time for the man, and he actually asked to die while he was hooked up to the machine. His mental and physical state for most of the ordeal was terrible. Things improved and artificial hearts got somewhat better, but the chances of living to a ripe old age with an artificial heart is still off the cards. Think about it. The real heart is a busy organ and it must pump blood around the body non-stop and it must do that job to perfection. It can't take time off like the rest of the body. It's finely tuned, perfect for most of us. When hearts start skipping beats or decide to take a break, or maybe they go overboard with the pumping action, the person who owns them generally does the hand on heart and fall to the floor routine. Getting it right is hard. And as one doctor put it, creating a workable artificial heart has become the holy grail for researchers. So we have a situation in which an artificial heart might keep a person going for a while, but it's only supposed to be a bridge before that person can get a heart transplant. Some people have to wait a long time and those artificial hearts in some cases don't do the job. People died before they got the transplant. It was only in the last decade that some people led pretty normal lives with a temporary artificial heart. They weren't confined to a hospital and didn't have to plug themselves into massive compressors. In 2015, there were cases of people getting artificial hearts and they just had to carry around with them a battery and an air pump that could fit in a backpack. It was noisy though, which could really get a person down when the pumping sound was 24-7, and anyone close also had to hear it. There are other dangers too. One guy who got one of those machines said while getting ready for a sponge bath, he accidentally knocked over the compressor and then the battery stopped working and that meant that his heart stopped working and he fell to the floor ready to die. Luckily, the backup battery had his back and his fake heart resumed activities. The problem with that is the constant worry that the thing will malfunction and also having to remember to keep those batteries charged. A dead battery means a dead person and being hooked up to the valve and a compressor all day takes its toll on a person's spirit. It's also high risk odds. Sure, having an artificial heart beats death any day of the week, but some people even fairly recently have died soon after the device was implanted. One French recipient of an artificial heart got home after five months in the hospital. In an interview, he told the French newspaper, I have completely recovered, I can walk, I can get up and I can bend down 10 to 15 times a day without any difficulty. In fact, I have never felt so good. And the guy died shortly after the interview. Ok, we might have taken some time to get around to the US teen who lived with no heart at all, not even an artificial one. But if you didn't know the backstory, her story wouldn't mean that much to you. So her name is Dejana Simmons and in 2008 when she was 14 years old, she got out of a hospital with a new heart. Her original heart had become enlarged and so it had to go. The girl would have died from that condition. Her story is special because the doctor said she was one of a kind. Ok, a German man survived with absolutely no heart, but he was the only one until Dejana came along, so she was the first child to go fully heartless. She said it was scary and she never knew if the machine was just going to malfunction, so talk about putting your trust into a device. The girl had actually had a heart transplant in the past, but that first heart didn't take and she had to wait for another. Doctors explained that with other cases such as ones we've talked about today, the person's heart is left in the body. Sure, in the stories we've talked about, people have been given a new artificial heart, but with Dejana, she had the whole thing removed and was kept alive by pumps connected to only blood vessels. What happened was called a big deal in medical science since it was the first time it ever happened to a child. The head doctor told the press it had never been done in a pediatric patient. Dejana herself said she was kind of a miracle child. After her time without a heart, she crossed the bridge and got a new heart, and this time it was the right fit. She might need to replace it one day, but she seemed to be living well the last time the media talked about her. Let's face it, most of us would like to look good, have the body of a sculpted Adonis, without having to constantly diet and spend three hours in the gym every day. We don't all have the cash to be told how to work out by a rather strict personal trainer, and who on earth wants to go under the knife and have their belly fat suctioned out and then have a surgical six pack made? We want the best results with the least amount of effort, and today we're going to tell you how it's done. 
14. Don't work out first thing While we might admire people that wake up early and start doing their exercise routine, there is quite a bit of evidence that tells us that this is not a good thing at all. Your muscles and joints, according to most health sources, are just not ready. You need to warm up first, and so make sure you've walked around a bit before you work out. As for eating something before you exercise, well, that's a debate still raging. Some experts say if you want to burn more fat, work out before you eat. Then again, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics tell us that it's better to have a small snack. The best kind of meal for an energy boost in the morning would contain simple carbs such as a bowl of yogurt and some fruit. 13. Couch Potato Workout If you seriously don't want to leave your house to go to the gym, then use your house to get fit. You can do dips on your couch or tables or chairs, and just a few of these once or twice a day will work out your triceps. We assure you it won't take long to see a difference. Add to that one plank a day in the comfort of your room. Start with just a few seconds and build up to a minute. Most of the experts out there will tell us that a minute is a decent plank time. This will make a huge difference to your stomach muscles. When you're in the kitchen, simply lunge now and again while waiting for something to cook. If you can't do that, you can go down on your heels with a straight back. Put the weight mostly on your back heels. This is called a squat. If you're feeling super fit, jump up at the end of it. You could also do a burpee in your room, and these are great for your body. Just these simple exercises you can do while watching TV and waiting for the kettle to boil can make a profound difference to your body. You really don't need the gym to get in shape, nor do you have to buy the 20 minute hellish workout videos. 12. Put pressure on yourself. How many of you have said, OK, tomorrow I'm definitely starting my workout routine? You know what happens next. You wake up and the person the night before who was determined to get fit no longer exists. You say, hmm, OK, maybe I'll start tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, as the saying goes. Well, the fitness experts have a kind of hack for this. They say pack your workout gear into a bag the night before. Put that bag close to the house or apartment door or even in your car. If you've gone to that much effort, you will likely work out. Taking all the stuff out of the bag is an effort in itself and it will make you feel like a very lazy person. 11. But not that much pressure According to the health experts, a lot of people don't even start working out because it just looks like too much work. Well, then don't make it too hard. Start your routine if you want as a 5-minute workout, not one long session that almost kills you. If you start with a difficult workout like that, it's likely you won't go back. Something is better than nothing. Go easy on yourself. When you're watching the TV in the room, maybe plank for 10 seconds. Trust us, this is better than nothing at all. We know it's not something you'll hear often from those great motivators of mankind, but set the bar low if you aren't used to working out. 10. Create a reward system There should always be a payoff for working out, whether that's how it affects your body or perhaps it's what you can put into your body. Get in the habit of rewarding yourself for what you do. 10 press-ups in the living room is a job well done. Now you can actually start playing that video game or give yourself a snack. When you start doing this, you'll actually feel guilty if you don't work out before you can eat or relax. Maybe if you go to the gym, do something enjoyable after each session. When you do this, your brain starts to relate the gym with that blissful activity and you'll go back again. 9. Leave things around the house Even if you don't have a routine at all, just buy some dumbbells and perhaps some kettlebells and leave them in the bedroom, kitchen, living room, garden, etc. It's very likely that when you see them, you'll occasionally pick them up. 8. Just don't eat for a while Intermittent fasting is the great lazy person's diet. It really takes no effort. In fact, it's easier than actually eating because you don't have to cook or even move. Many studies these days will show you that intermittent fasting will make most people lose weight. Other studies show that it can have health benefits. Start with a 16-hour fast, which means only eating in the evening and then eating around midday the next day. Reading forums about this, a lot of people said once they've done it one time, it was easy and they kept doing it. Many people said they also felt mentally agile as well as physically good. You can also do 18-hour or 24-hour fasts. It's not bad for your health, but best if you're in good health before you fast. If you have health problems, talk to your doctor about fasting before trying it. Also, make sure you drink water throughout the fast. 7. Listen Listen to a podcast or an audiobook while you're exercising and tell yourself you can only listen to it when you're exercising. If it's interesting, you'll want to go back to it, and so you'll have to do more exercise. 6. Treat exercise like a drinking game You can do this with your friends. You all know the drinking game in which you must drink when someone on TV does something or says something? Yes, it can get you quite drunk. Well, do the same but change drinking to say push-ups or sit-ups. Maybe you're watching a movie with your friend and you split characters in that movie. Every time character A does this, your friend must do 5 push-ups. And every time character B does this, you must do some exercise. It's fun and it's great seeing your buddy sweat it out. You can also do it alone, but it's not as much fun. 5. More playing 
But what if you don't like doing much but playing video games and watching YouTube videos? Then get yourself an exercise bike and do your playing and watching while on that bike. In fact, it's said with games, the more intense it gets, you'll actually pedal faster. You won't even know you're working out, burning tons of calories and getting fit. 4. Don't join a gym or get a personal trainer Yeah, you won't often hear this. Basically, the gym costs money and personal trainers cost a fortune. You've been thinking about both for a while now, but hey, save yourself some money. Do the workouts at home or in the street, and then pay yourself the cash you've saved. 3. Brothers in Arms Anyone who's taken up exercise will tell you this. Start doing your routine with another person who is about as good as you. None of you will want to let the other down, and you might also start to get a bit competitive, which is good. Having another person around you will motivate you. On those days you just can't be bothered, they will be the boost you need. 2. Make the house a great big circuit This means every time you go into a certain room, you have to do a certain exercise. You might try and avoid the kitchen because in there you have to do a number of squats. Maybe just start with one squat. The bedroom is the part of the circuit that you have to do a push-up or a number of push-ups. The living room is where you have to do your planking, of course, because as we said, planking and the TV go hand in hand. Do your lunges in another room. This might sound like hard work, but when you've done it once, it just becomes a habit. As we've said before too, set the bar low. Do what's easy for you at first and build up. Soon enough, you'll start feeling proud when you've made progress. Rome wasn't built in a day. 1. Look good Invest a decent amount of money in what you wear to the gym. This will motivate you to actually wear that stuff, and when you do wear it, you'll feel good. You'll need to enjoy wearing that gear. Another thing, let's face it, many people work out because they want to look attractive to people. Nice clothes will already make you look good, and the more working out you do, the better those clothes will look. Spend an amount of money on the clothes that you really feel you must use them. Once you're at the gym or the running track, you may end up having a crush on someone and we can tell you from experience that this is the greatest motivator of all time. If you're dressed well, you'll feel confident in front of this person and you'll want to keep seeing them. This will mean you'll have to keep working out. And hey, if you ever start a relationship with them, you have a workout partner. Beats meeting someone in a bar and having a drinking partner. Chances are you're doing it right now. That's right, sitting. Some of you are sitting on the can while you watch this video. Ew, don't forget to regularly disinfect your phone. Some of you are curled up on the couch or sitting up against your headboard in bed. Others are hunched over their computers. There's a slight chance that you're one of those go-getters that watches infographics videos as you walk on a treadmill or use the stair climber. Well, jolly good for you. I salute you from the depths of my coffee-stained, cheesy puff crumb crusted but ergonomic office chair in my cubicle at the Infographics Institute. <laughs> We infographics writers may drink far too much coffee for our own good, but there's one thing we take seriously in regards to our health, ergonomics, specifically how we sit at our desks. Sitting badly can kill you. Sure, you're probably rolling your eyes, yeah, yeah, you're aware that a sedentary lifestyle isn't good for you and you should get frequent exercise. Very true, but right now I'm discussing posture. Slouching is bad for you. The average human head weighs about 10 pounds. When you hunch or roll your shoulder in and hang your head forward while sitting, you're shifting that weight onto your upper back and spine. Some researchers think that for every inch you hold your head forward, you add 10 pounds of pressure on your spine. So if you're slouching forward 2 inches, your neck and upper back has to work extra hard to hold up an extra 20 pounds. When you relax that pressure, such as by leaving your desk after a long day of work, your muscles can spasm and cause nasty tension headaches. Bad posture misaligns your spine and can also lead to back, jaw, neck, and nerve pain. Furthermore, you might be compressing or contorting your internal organs. Sitting with your body bent over causes your insides to push against each other, especially the organs in the abdominal area, and this can lead to decreased blood circulation. Experiencing bad posture for several hours a day on a regular basis causes all sorts of chronic conditions, such as insomnia due to random body aches, pinched nerves, slipped discs, constipation, poor balance, impaired organ function, and the increased risk of developing arthritis due to abnormal wear and tear on both surfaces. Maybe you think that this is not a big deal. You sit hunched over all the time and your back feels fine. You forgot two words, right now, as in your back feels fine right now. Trust us, if time machines are invented in 50 years, your senior citizen age self is going to rent one and come back to 2020 to slap you for sitting badly. Quite often, the sitting choices you make now have implications many years down the road as your body ages. You ever wonder why some old people are stooped over? Frequently hunching can cause you to lose height. You develop hypercophosis or an excessive curvature of the thoracic spine, commonly referred to as hunchback. A study of older people with hyperkyphotic posture found that their risk of early death from atherosclerosis and pulmonary disease was increased by 44%. So how should you sit instead? 
Upright Head up, core muscles engaged, shoulders relaxed with your butt and hips against the back of the chair, and your feet flat on the floor. Make sure your back is supported. It's best if your chair is ergonomic, but inflatable cushions and small pillows can help too. If you're using a computer, the keyboard should be directly in front of you at a close but comfortable distance. Generally, your arm should be bent about 90 degrees and you should lightly rest on your chair's armrests. Or your computer should be set back far enough that your arms can rest on your desk. You shouldn't be holding your arms up with no support under them. Your eye level should be slightly below the top of your computer screen. These are just some tips to get you started. Some good sitting posture habits will depend on your height, individual body, workspace, and should be tailored to your particular needs. Aside from having an ergonomic work area, it's important to take breaks. No matter how great your sitting posture is, prolonged static positions will take a toll on your body. At regular intervals, preferably every 40-50 to 50 minutes, take a break. Blink, stand up, stretch, take a quick walk around the building, go get some water, anything to get you moving for a few minutes. Taking multiple short breaks throughout your working time is better than only taking one long break. Other than sitting for work or school, you probably sit on the couch or in an armchair for relaxation. You should practice good posture here too. Don't twist yourself up like a pretzel. Your feet should be on the floor, your butt against the back of the seat, and your back supported. Also, be aware of how much you're bending your neck to look at your mobile phone. In recent years, medical professionals have begun treating a condition commonly called text neck. While people of any age experience this, strikingly many of the sufferers are in their teens and 20s. Sufferers have been holding electronic devices at chest or waist level and looking down at the device. Similar to the effects of frequent hunching, this posture causes neck muscles to be shortened and tightened, and shoulders to be rounded forward. Lying down with your head propped up at an awkward angle and talking on the phone with the device pinned between your ear and your shoulder are terrible for your body too. While using your device, be conscious of any pain you feel. Hold your phone higher so you don't bend as much and your neck stays relaxed. It may sound a little silly, but you may need to take breaks from relaxing to stretch. Instead of cradling your phone with your shoulder, use the speakerphone function or a headset. If you play video games, it's crucial to take breaks too. It's rare, but in recent years, few gamers have died from marathon gaming sessions where they sit in the same position for 10 plus hours. They experienced deep vein thrombosis, and the clot traveled through their bloodstream up to their lungs and caused a pulmonary embolism. We all know there's a risk of an accident and injury when riding in a car. However, sitting incorrectly in the front passenger seat can greatly increase your risk of fatality or serious injury. You may have seen a picture of an x-ray that went around the internet a few months ago. A passenger's life was forever altered by being in an accident while she sat with her feet propped up on the dashboard. One of her hips broke and the other was dislocated. Even when the accident is not severe, riding with feet on the dashboard is bad news. Airbags deploy between 120 to 220 miles per hour. That means that everyone else in the car may walk away with minor injuries since they were cushioned by their airbag, but airbags act like bombs for passengers with their feet on the dashboard. In one accident where everyone else walked away, a passenger who had their feet on the dashboard ended up spending painful months relearning how to walk. Her injuries included one kneecap pushing up and breaking her eye socket. On the other leg, her ankle snapped and her foot twisted up and shattered her nose, driving her teeth through her lower lip. Her head snapped back and got concussed, permanently affecting her memory. If you're a passenger, always sit with your feet on the floor and your seat belt buckled in. The lower belt should sit snugly across your lap and pelvis area, never your stomach. If you're pregnant, you should wear the lap belt below your belly. Adjust the shoulder harness to fit comfortably across your collarbone and chest. It should never rub on your neck or face. Never put the shoulder belt behind your back or under your arm. That defeats the point of it. If you're transporting children, make sure you have the appropriate safety seat for their size. Most of us would not drive a baby around if we didn't have a car seat, but we'll bend the rules for a young child. I get it, you're watching your nephew and you want a snack, a drive through for Rick Ronalds is right near your house, and your nephew is big for his age and he's good at following instructions, especially if there are french fries involved, so he'll sit quietly buckled in for the duration of the trip. Don't do it. Various surveys show that nearly one-third of all car crashes in the US occur less than 5 miles from home. A 2017 CDC study found that car seat use reduces the risk of injury and crashes by 71-82% to 82 for children when compared with seat belt use alone. Also, booster seat use reduces the risk of serious injury by 45% for children aged 4 to 8, when compared with seat belt use alone. If you have questions about passenger safety, check the driving license guidelines for your area and the CDC. Those are good places to start. Lastly, we like to talk about dropping a deuce. Yep, you heard that correctly, pooping. 
Some medical professionals think that you're pooping wrong. While not definitive, there's some evidence to suggest that modern Western toilets encourage and can aggravate pooping problems such as hemorrhoids and constipation. When you sit on a toilet with your knees at a right angle, your puborectalis muscle, the muscle responsible for continence, relaxes only partially. When you squat like a significant portion of the world, your puborectalis muscle relaxes completely, meaning that it's easier to evacuate waste and far less straining is required. Some researchers have likened sitting on a toilet as opposed to squatting like having a kink in a garden hose. So if you want to address this issue and maybe make dropping the kids off at the pool easier, you can learn to squat over the bowl or sit as normal but raise your knees higher than your hips by placing your feet on a stool, etc., to create a natural squatting position. Hey, the Infographics Institute is just a purveyor of fascinating and useful information. What you do with that information is up to you. For years, people have been hitting the weights to build muscles, and lots of people seem to focus specifically on bigger arms. It seems a lot of guys spend all of their gym time working on that one part of the body, with many people pretty much leaving their bottom half alone. Why the biceps are so important, we don't know. But if you want that action hero look, you're going to have to have a pair of fine, muscular arms. So today we'll tell you how to get that Terminator look and how to get it fast. First of all, we don't advise that you only work out this one part of your body. Just add this to your routine each day and even if you take a day off, it's okay to keep with the bicep training. We advise that you stretch after exercising and eat plenty of healthy, protein-rich foods. We also recommend that you don't go heavy every day. You don't have to go all out, but you should try to get the perfect technique. We'll start with the one we all know, or at least have seen. Day 1 – Crossbody Hammer Curl You'll do three sets in total. Each set will consist of eight reps for each arm. Ok, how do you do it? Choose a weight which you think you can manage for three sets. We suggest you start lighter and build up. It's good to warm up the muscle, but at some point we want you to struggle somewhat. We don't want you to take it too easy, but nor do we want you to try and lift something so heavy your technique is awful. This goes for every exercise we'll talk about today. Stand with your back straight, holding the dumbbells in each hand. Your palms should be facing in. So far, so good. Now, you're going to lift one of your arms towards your opposite shoulder without twisting the dumbbell. It's just straight up but across the body. So if you have the weight in your right hand, you'll be lifting it towards your left shoulder, hence the name cross body. As you lift slowly, exhale and hold the weight at the uppermost part of the movement for a very short time. You then slowly lower the dumbbell down to where you started. Keep your breathing and movement stable, no erratic jerks. Do the same for the other arm and finish the sets. Day 2 – Barbell Curl You'll do two sets, but each set will consist of five repetitions. Yep, that won't be easy. Again, start light and move up. To start, stand up straight, no slouching. Hold the barbell with your hands at shoulder length. Your elbows should be quite close to your body right now. You're going to bring the weight closer to your body, but what's important here is how you move. It should really only be your forearms that are moving. When you get to the top part of the movement, hold it for just a second and squeeze your biceps. This is going to burn at some point, but that's all good. Bring the bar down slowly, keeping this sturdy technique. Keep doing that until you've completed the sets. Day 3 – Dumbbell Floor Press You'll do three sets and each set will consist of ten repetitions. You might not have heard of this one, so listen carefully. Grab hold of some dumbbells and lie down with your back on the floor. It's not cheating to bend your knees. Hold those weights right above your head so your elbows are locked. Now you must lower the weights until your elbows reach the floor. It's up to you, but if you tuck in your arms, it will affect the triceps more. If your arms are more to the side, this will get your chest. When you push them up, the weights should meet at the top. Day 4 – Dips – Tricep Version We know we're talking about biceps, but you'll need to do this kind of exercise too if you want to look like Popeye. You'll do two sets and five repetitions. What you'll need is a pair of bars to do your dips on. The problem with this for some people is that they struggle to do even one, and we are trying to do lots of them. Don't fear, because many gyms will have an assist machine that helps push you up. If you can't find one, you can get a friend to partly assist you. If that's out of the question, just do what you can. If you can't even do one, maybe do the dips on a bench. Start with your arms locked and straight and then slowly lower yourself down. Inhale while you're doing this. You should go so low that there's a 90 degree angle between the upper arm and the forearm. When you push back up, exhale. Try and keep your back straight and your elbows close to your body. Day 5 – Superset on the last day of this workout, you're going to do two exercises for your arms. The first of these is called a cable hammer curl. You'll do four sets with 20 repetitions each time. You'll need a machine for this, but most gyms nowadays have these machines. The machine should have a pulley system and you'll attach a rope to the bottom pulley. This is so you can pull the weight up with your biceps. Stand about one foot away from the machine and keep your back straight. Your double rope will be held with your two hands and your palms faced inwards. 
each hand on one rope. Your elbows should be tucked into your sides for this exercise and only your forearms should move. If you start wildly moving about, you're definitely doing it wrong. Next, pull your arms up as you exhale. When you get to the top, hold it for a second and squeeze those now bulging biceps. Now slowly inhale as you carefully lower the ropes to where you started. Remember, this is not about speed, but technique. Those guys in the gym going fast as they can and moving all over the place are doing it wrong. When you bring weights down slowly, you're working the muscle more. The second part of this superset is called the triceps pull down, and you'll also need a machine with a pulley for this, except now you're pulling down rather than pulling up. You'll also do 4 sets and each set will have 20 reps. To do this, you'll attach a double rope to the pulley, also one of those ropes you can pull apart into a V-shape. This time, you'll stand almost straight, but it's good if you stand slightly inclined, leaning toward the machine. After this, you'll slowly bring the rope down so your hands are going to your thighs. When you get down to the bottom, the top part of your arm should be right up against your body, but the hands should have spread apart so that the rope makes a V. Still keep your hands close to your body. It's only your forearms that should really move. Exhale as you go down and inhale when you go back up. Don't rush this exercise. You might also find a V-shaped bar in the gym, and this works just as well as the rope. So there you go. Do these 5 days and repeat until you hit 30 days and you'll certainly see the difference. There are of course lots and lots of variations of bicep and triceps workouts, but these exercises cover everything. It's all you really need to create those bulging arms. Now all you have to do is try it and come back later and tell us what changes you saw. You'll often hear inspiring headlines about one in a million surgeries pulled off by talented surgeons and dedicated nurses, improving or even saving the lives of patients. But for every dream come true, there is always a nightmare. We're talking about the real hack jobs, sawn off limbs, tangled tubes, horrifying body cavity souvenirs, and even one exceptional case, a surgery with a 300% mortality rate. If you're eating, now is the time to stop, because we're about to get nasty, weird, and gross. These are some of history's most insane surgical mistakes. While things are arguably much better now, medical malpractice was horrifyingly common far more recently than you think. Harvard University conducted a study into New York hospitals in 1991, finding that 1 in 25 patients were victims of medical malpractice. But thankfully, even then, the cases we're talking about today are exceptional, and exceptionally horrible to boot. There's even a term for them in medical lingo, never events, meaning things that should never happen. But they do, and all too often, in fact. First, let's talk about the horrifying case of mistaken identity. When people are given surgeries intended for others due to egregious clerical errors, take 81-year-old Bimla Nayar. For instance, she was supposed to receive surgery for a jaw displacement in Oakwood Hospital, Michigan. However, she was about to experience something a whole lot worse. Doctors at the hospital mixed up Nayar's CT scan with that of another patient and mistakenly assumed that she was experiencing bleeding from the brain. Nayar was rushed into brain surgery immediately, sawing the right side of her skull open only to find no bleeding. When the surgery was over, Nayar needed to be kept on life support in a comatose state for 60 days. When her recovery was deemed extremely improbable, the ventilator was turned off and Nayar died, all because of a damaged jaw and extreme medical negligence. Unsurprisingly, her family filed a lawsuit and was awarded $21 million. Back in 1995, Dr. Ronaldo R. Sanchez was a menace to anyone who liked keeping their limbs. In the first of his two nightmare surgeries, Dr. Sanchez was amputating a patient's leg. However, halfway through the surgery, he noticed that his nurse had begun to cry. She tearfully told him that he was amputating the wrong leg, and Dr. Sanchez was furious. He blamed pretty much everyone but himself, including his team, and even said that he hadn't done anything wrong because the leg he was cutting off was also diseased, and he probably would have needed to do it anyway. Incidentally, nurses in Tampa, Florida have figured out a method for preventing this kind of wrongful amputation, writing the word NO on the arm or leg that isn't meant to be amputated. It's very Florida, but hey, if it works, it works. Dr. Sanchez would return to perform another feat of epic medical malpractice before finally losing his medical license. Mildred Schuler needed some infected tissue cut from her right foot in what should have been a very simple operation, but Dr. Sanchez always liked to go above and beyond. He took the entire big toe on Mildred's right foot, insisting it was necessary. The medical board insisted that it was necessary Dr. Sanchez no longer be allowed to practice shortly thereafter. In April 2015, 49-year-old Edwifes Rodriguez also found herself missing some pieces. After finding a lump in one of her breasts and going to the hospital about it, she was misdiagnosed with breast cancer and had one of her breasts removed in a hospital in Manhattan. However, analysis on the severed breasts instead discovered that the lump had actually been a benign growth and that the breast did not, in fact, need to be removed. 
Though to play devil's advocate, it's generally better to be safe than sorry when it comes to breast cancer. Speaking of sorry, a hospital in Lebanon, Tennessee needed to apologize profusely to Nate Melton and his mother Jennifer after a pretty heinous mix-up. Nate Melton was literally one day old when he became the recipient of an unneeded phrenectomy, otherwise known as a tongue clipping surgery. This procedure cuts the tissue that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Nurses came to take Jennifer Melton's brand new baby away for what she thought was a standard checkup, only to find, to her horror, that the doctor was performing surgery. As you probably guessed already, he had been mixed up with another patient. Jennifer got her lawyers involved shortly after. During the 2010s, a doctor from Sheffield, UK proved to be a serial surgical bungler. In a more minor act of medical stupidity, he removed a skin tag instead of a cyst. However, in a more severe example of malpractice, he botched two different appendectomies. In the first, he simply removed some fat from a woman who needed the surgery, leaving her in terrible pain until the second surgery could be performed. But even that pales in comparison to a 2015 incident, where during an appendectomy he removed a woman's ovary and fallopian tube during the surgery. He said in his own defense that the organs looked very similar to an appendix due to his poor eyesight. The UK medical board could see a little clearer and decided to permanently ban this negligent doctor from treating patients again. We can all rest a little easier now knowing that the guy won't be handling a scalpel at work anymore. But here's the thing, while we are all probably feeling a little paranoid about an incompetent doctor sawing off the wrong limb or taking out one of our perfectly healthy organs, it's not always what these screwy surgeons take that's the problem. Sometimes the issue is what they accidentally leave behind. This may seem like a rare incident, but it's actually upsettingly common. There are several thousand instances of medical supplies being left behind in patients after surgery every year, and that's in the United States alone. Though with the cost of healthcare, you'd probably want to get some freebies with your surgery. The grand majority of the medical equipment left inside patients is medical gauze and sponges, but in the minority of cases, actual surgical tools are left behind. In one incredibly bizarre case, a man from the Czech Republic somehow had a foot-long pipe left inside his body after surgery, which then needed to be removed a month later in a subsequent surgery. In another paranoia-inducing case, Air Force Major Erica Parks had just given birth with the help of an emergency C-section. However, unlike most people who'd just given birth, her stomach continued to grow. She also became severely ill and began to experience abdominal pain. She was rushed into surgery only for doctors to find the culprit. A surgical sponge from the earlier C-section had become wrapped up in her intestines, swelling and becoming infected inside her body. It took a six-hour surgery to finally remove the sponge. It would have been easier to just not leave it in there. Even hearing about some of these cases can be cringe-inducing. A man undergoing treatment for cancer in Wisconsin somehow had a 13-inch surgical retractor left inside his body. A woman undergoing surgery for a uterine cancer had a small pair of surgical scissors left inside her body. A woman undergoing a hysterectomy once somehow even had a whole surgical glove left inside her body in the aftermath. Much like Major Parks and the surgical sponge, these cases can be incredibly dangerous as well as uncomfortable and painful because foreign objects left inside the body can massively increase risk of infection. But if you think everything you've heard before was bad, trust us, it can always get worse. What comes after will make a stolen toe or a misplaced scalpel seem like a pleasant medical experience by comparison. We're warning you, this next one is probably the most disgusting surgical mistake on this list. Put down that sandwich, or you're really going to regret it. The story of a 31-year-old Chilean woman named Yasna Cortez Caceres hit headlines in 2018 after she signed up for a basic fallopian tube tying operation in Culique Hospital, Central Chile. As a mother of four children already, Ms. Caceres wanted to put her reproduction on hold until further notice. However, the surgery was botched in a particularly horrifying manner after two cuts in her large intestine caused a fistula to develop. And that's as unpleasant as it sounds. A fistula is an abnormal connection forming between two hollow spaces in the body. In this case, there was an unnatural overlap between her intestines and her reproductive organs. The result is that Ms. Caceres was suddenly defecating through her vagina. A gross and embarrassing problem that also led to her needing to buy over $100 worth of colostomy bags every single day. The employees at Quilique Hospital did apologize profusely for their mistake here and have been providing subsequent surgeries in hopes of solving the problem. We don't actually have any details on that, so we can only hope that Ms. Caceres is satisfied with the results. Personally, we just wish we could forget about it. And finally, the most insane surgical mistake of all, the legendary surgeon with a 300% mortality rate. How is such a thing even possible, you're probably wondering. It definitely wasn't easy, but an exceptional mistake takes an exceptional surgeon, 
and the 19th century Scottish master of amputation Robert Liston was truly exceptional. You see, in the early 1800s, anesthesia wasn't all that popular in surgery, so grisly procedures like amputations were performed while the patient was still conscious. This is as horrible as it sounds. There was lots of screaming and thrashing involved, and every surgery required a team of strong assistants to hold the patient in place. Given that undergoing this kind of surgery was horrible, short surgeries began to equal successful surgeries, and Liston was famed for being the fastest amputator in the UK. He even had the cocky catchphrase, tie me gentlemen, before he took the sawing. He could apparently even take off a leg in two minutes, which for using a handsaw on a screaming, wriggling patient is pretty damn impressive. But it was his legendary off day that allows him to endure in the history of surgical weirdness. During this fateful surgery, Liston was doing his thing, sawing like a madman to remove his patient's leg as quickly as possible. However, an assistant got too close and accidentally lost a few of his fingers to Liston's masterful blade work. Earlier that same surgery, Liston accidentally cut into the clothes of an elderly surgeon supervising the expert butchery. While Liston hadn't actually cut the old surgeon, he was still covered in blood from the messy surgery and assumed that Liston had suffered something important. The old man collapsed and died of a heart attack on the spot. That's fatality number one. Fatality number two was the death of the assistant who'd lost some fingers. Apparently, the saw was less than clean, resulting in the assistant's later contracting gangrene and dying from his infected injuries. Oh, and as the cherry on top of this excessively bloody cake, the patient didn't pull through either. Three people dead, one surgery. Liston managed to pull off the only surgery with a 300% mortality rate, an achievement he was probably less proud of than his impressive cutting time. So there you have it some of history's bloody, disgusting, and downright insane surgical mistakes. In case you're thinking of putting off your next doctor's appointment after this, don't sweat it. These cases are the exceptions rather than the rule. But hey, if you do find yourself on the receiving end of a horrifying surgical mistake, at least you might make the next video. No one likes going to the dentist, but it's essential for the health of your teeth. The worst most people encounter in the dental chair is the pain of the Novocaine injection, the irritating sound of the drill, and the annoying numbness after it. But for one British soldier, a visit to the dentist for root canal surgery had shocking consequences. It was 2005 and William was a member of the British Armed Forces, stationed in Germany. His grandfather had recently passed away, so he flew back to Britain to pay his regards before returning to base. Life was good. He was serving his country, he was happily married, and the father of an 11-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. And he was an active man in good health who frequented the gym and played volleyball. But he had a nagging tooth issue and needed a root canal. So he made an appointment for the dentist on March 14th, sat down in the chair, and let the dentist inject him with local anesthetic. It was the last thing he would ever remember. William's case has become one of the greatest medical mysteries in modern British history, because after he was injected with anesthetic, his mind goes blank. What little we know of the day of the procedure is from William's dentist. The injection seemed to go fine, and William seemed healthy as he came into the office. It was only after the surgery, when the dentist asked him to remove his glasses, that everything went wrong. William was unusually pale, and he couldn't stand up easily. He needed to lie down while the office called his wife to pick him up, and when she arrived, he stared blankly at her. He didn't recognize her and seemed to be in a mental fog. It was clear something was very wrong and he was taken to the hospital. It took a while for the mental fog to disappear, but what followed was even stranger. Interviews with William revealed he remembered everything up to his surgery with perfect clarity. But roughly every 90 minutes, his mind reset, and the last thing he could remember was sitting down in that dentist chair to get anesthetic. Not exactly a pleasant memory to look back on, and also a condition with no clear medical cause. The first suspicion was that he had a negative reaction to the anesthetic, possibly due to an allergy. This could cause a brain hemorrhage, and the brain bleed could damage the memory center of the brain. Tests were ordered and quickly came up blank, with no evidence of brain injury. The doctors knew what was wrong with William, but the why was a mystery. With no way to treat William and no physical cause, he was soon discharged into the care of his family. They moved back to England where they sought the help of an expert, clinical psychologist Gerald Burgess, who was experienced in amnesia disorders. While amnesia is a common condition often related to brain injury, William's symptoms didn't match the more common retrograde amnesia, where people lose past memories. He had anterograde amnesia, where all or most past memories are preserved, but new ones are constantly erased. It's usually caused by benzodiazepine drug use or brain injury that damages the hippocampus caused by trauma, illness, or surgery. It can also be caused by a milder form of alcohol intoxication, which causes people to black out. 
but William's case didn't match any of those factors. There were relatively few cases of anterograde amnesia as serious as William's, but Burgess was able to study the strange case of Henry Moliason, a young man who suffered from severe epilepsy. He underwent an experimental and radical surgery to remove the lobes from his brain to try to control the seizures. The removed areas included the hippocampi, two curved regions at the center of the brain that control the recording of episodic memories. While it worked and made his epilepsy more manageable, it removed the part of his brain that allowed him to form new memories. While his cognitive abilities seemed intact, anything he learned was quickly erased and he lived in a care home until his death almost 50 years after his surgery. His case was heavily debated and his brain was studied post-death for insights into how memory works. But activity in William's brain seemed normal sending Burgess seeking for other answers. It soon became clear that William's case was different from Henry's. Henry couldn't remember new things that happened to him, but the areas of his brain that stored knowledge of skills were intact. Researchers would teach him things and he would maintain those skills even as his memory vanished. But when Burgess asked William to master a complex maze, he seemed able to do it, only for the skill to then vanish like chalk being erased from a chalkboard. Every time he tried, he would make the same errors and progress at the same rate. And this raises the question, is it all in his head? Well, the answer is probably yes, given that the brain is in the head. But in the absence of any obvious trauma that would cause William's amnesia, Burgess turned to psychological possibilities. Psychogenic amnesia is a common memory disorder that causes memory loss from a period ranging from hours to years. It usually involves suppressing information that's particularly traumatic. It usually involves retrograde amnesia, where people can't remember past trauma. But cases of anterograde amnesia with this cause are virtually unheard of. Burgess wasn't ready to rule out and interviewed William's wife Samantha and others to see if he'd experienced any trauma. Aside from the recent death of his grandfather, which he still remembered, William didn't seem to have anything that would explain this bizarre memory loss, and current interviews with him seemed to show an overall emotionally healthy person. So what's the answer to this medical mystery? To this day, Burgess still doesn't know exactly, but the doctor has his theories. While the brain is full of critical regions like the hippocampi, it depends on something much smaller to keep functioning, the synapses. These microscopic neural connections carry memories from the short term to the long term via millions of tiny paths to send memories into our long term memory and ensure we can look back on critical memories for years to come, there needs to be a supply of proteins to keep the synapses in shape. If the brain isn't producing enough of this protein, the memories all just fade away, just like more insignificant memories. Can you remember exactly what you ate for lunch on June 1st, 2007? Probably not, and that's because your brain is selective about what it keeps. The brain wouldn't be capable of storing every bit of information we encounter every day, so it sorts through them in the short-term memory and ensures only the important ones stay. But a study with rats indicates this critical connection may be more tenuous than we know. It's common to do experiments with rats to test how they learn new skills. So common, in fact, that rats in a maze and the rat race have become basic euphemisms. But an experiment that introduced a compound that would block these proteins in the synapses from forming proved that rats would learn new skills and then forget them soon, puzzling over the same mazes and tasks they'd just learned. This was the closest comparison to what William seemed to be experiencing. While Henry Meliason no longer had the physical parts of his brain needed to form new memories, William seemed to have lost the connection he needed to make memories permanent. Think of the brain as a printer. It was as if someone had taken a hammer to Henry's printer, but William may have simply ran out of ink. The question is, why, and has it ever happened before? Burgess combed the history of medicine to find similar cases to William's, hoping to find an answer for his patient. The pickings were slim. He found five cases where the patients had suffered a mysterious memory loss without a physical or drug-related trauma associated with it. But if there was a direct connection to undergoing a dental procedure, it wasn't found here. While none of the other five had been to the dentist or had a root canal, they all seemed to undergo serious stress due to a medical emergency. Could the stress of the medical intervention trigger a strange chemical reaction in the brain? Burgess can't say yes, but he also can't say no. Oddly, the most helpful case may come from fiction. In a crazy coincidence, a year before William's case began, a popular Hollywood movie gave us a case study with shocking similarities to William's, and it just happened to star Adam Sandler. Fifty First Dates also starred Drew Barrymore as an unfortunate young woman whose car accident left her with a brain injury and a ticking 24-hour clock on her memory resetting to the day before her accident every morning. That made it tricky for Sandler's character to win her heart over and over again. While the movie was a romantic comedy and not a medical study, it did illustrate a potential solution to the problem of anterograde memory loss, creating reminders to catch up the person with amnesia when they wake up each morning. 
So has Hollywood given us the answers to William's strange case? In a word, no. Despite Gerald Burgess's many theories about the case, William's condition has remained unchanged and his memory is still frozen on March 14, 2005. But he and his wife had figured out a system that works similarly to the one in the movie, writing notes on his smartphone to tell him to read them as soon as he sees the file. This catches him up and lets him know why he can't remember anything, at least for 90 minutes. Burgess continued to study William's case and published an acclaimed paper in the Neurocase Journal with his theories in 2015, wondering if the wiring around the hippocampi or other areas responsible for processing memories may be the culprit. This brought new attention to William's case and allowed similar cases around the world to be discovered, including an English woman who hit her head on a pole and developed the same type of amnesia. But one area of William's memory proved more durable than expected. Emotions. It was shortly before his memory loss that his grandfather died, becoming one of his last formative memories. And during his long amnesia, he suffered another devastating loss when his father passed away. But unlike every other memory from this period that faded into the ether as easily as long-forgotten lunches, this one stayed. Today, he remembers that his father passed away even as his memory mysteriously resets. But all other key details continue to fade away. When interviewed, he still remembers his kids only as young children, even as they're grown into adulthood. And despite the research of some of the world's foremost experts on the human brain, the secrets of William's mystery remains just that, a secret. Contrary to what some believe, plastic surgery does not mean that plastic is involved. The term comes from a Greek word plastike, which means the art of modeling or sculpting. Plastic surgery is a catch-all phrase, indicating both restorative and cosmetic or aesthetic surgeries. Surprisingly, plastic surgery has been around a long time. Researchers found instruction for the repair of a broken nose in ancient Egyptian medical texts. Used in the Old Kingdom between 3000 and 2500 BC, Ancient India and the Romans also performed plastic surgeries, including ear, lip, and nose repair. The industry of modern plastic surgery grew rapidly after World War I when thousands of disfigured soldiers came home from the battlefield. Currently, the field of plastic surgery encompasses many surgical fields and includes craniofacial, pediatric, body contouring, and burn repair. According to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Statistics report, in the US, 14.9 million cosmetic procedures were performed in 2019 to the tune of 16.7 billion US dollars. This includes 13.4 minimally invasive procedures such as Botox and 1.5 million surgical procedures. 92% of all cosmetic procedures were performed on women patients. The top five most popular surgical procedures for 2019 were breast augmentation, eyelid surgery, liposuction, and nose reshaping or rhinoplasty. For females, the most popular surgery was breast augmentation and for males, rhinoplasty. So, what happens when you get a nose job or rhinoplasty? Well, it depends on why you're having the procedure. Common alteration requests are smoothing a prominent bump in the bridge of the nose, restoring symmetry to the nose following an injury, reducing the size of a nose that's too large, and correcting breathing problems by opening up blocked nasal passages. Each surgery is unique based on the needs of the patient and their particular facial anatomy. It's suggested that candidates for rhinoplasty be at least 19 years old before surgery. Typically, the nose is fully physically developed around age 14 for girls and age 16 for boys, but the rest of the face often continues to grow for a few more years. Although cosmetic surgeons take special care when evaluating young patients, it's best that the entire face be developed before rhinoplasty is performed so the results look as natural and congruent to the patient as possible. A quick nose anatomy lesson. The upper third of the nose, known as the bridge, consists of the nasal bone, while the lower portion of the nose consists of cartilage. The shape and appearance of the tip of the nose is formed by alar cartilage. The columella is the flesh at the base of the nose that lies between the nostrils. Internally, the two nostrils are separated by a thin layer of cartilage called the septum. Often, rhinoplasty is performed with the patient under general anesthesia. However, it can be performed with a patient intravenously sedated and under local anesthesia. The surgeon will begin by drawing guidelines on the patient's nose before performing one of two procedures. The surgeon can do a closed rhinoplasty or makes incisions inside each nostril. This procedure is most commonly used for patients who need minor adjustments to the nasal structures to achieve their desired improvements. The advantage of a closed rhinoplasty is that there's no visible scarring after surgery. If a patient is having extensive alterations or remodeling done to their nose, an open rhinoplasty procedure is performed. In open rhinoplasty, an incision is made across the columella. Also, incisions are made inside each nostril. 
basically opening the nose, which allows the surgeon more complete access to the internal nasal structures. Thankfully, the scars from an open rhinoplasty are generally hidden in the natural contours of the nose. Depending on the needs of the patient, the surgeon may remove alar cartridge to narrow a wide nose tip. Also, sutures may be inserted to bend or pull the alar cartridge in, creating a narrower tip or altering the shape of the nose tip. If the patient's septum is deviated, the surgeon will straighten it and cartilage may be removed from within the nostrils to improve breathing. The surgeon may remove a dorsal hump from the patient's nose by shaving away small portions of cartilage and nasal bone. Sometimes carving away a dorsal hump may leave the patient's nose with an open roof or a hole where the hump used to be. The surgeon will reposition the nasal bones in such a way as to close the open roof. Repositioning nasal bones can narrow the mid portion of the nose. If the narrowing is not desired, the placement of cartilage grafts are used to help the nose retain a wider shape. Nasal implants may also be used to alter the shape of the nose. Once the surgeon has finished making alterations to the patient's nose, incisions are closed with dissolvable stitches. Nasal airway splints or packing may be positioned in the patient's nose to stabilize and support the nose during recovery. Bandages and also a splint may be applied to the nose externally to also support and maintain the new shape of the nose as it heals. Patients often experience pain, bruising, and swelling, particularly around the eye area after surgery. A doctor may prescribe oral pain medication to keep the patient comfortable. Stitches, splints, and bandages are generally removed during a post-procedure appointment about a week after surgery. Most patients can then resume their regular activities. The worst of the swelling generally fades away within a few weeks of the surgery. However, minor swelling may persist for several months, and it may take up to a year before a patient's nasal contouring is complete. Silicone breast implants can be deadly. Watch this video to find out why. How did plastic surgery help World War I vets?